Okay, welcome everybody to the um, Texas State Board of Examiners of Marriage and Family Therapists to our October board meeting. Um, I am Dr. Lisa Merchant, and we are going to do begin with roll call. Chair Merchant. Present. Vice Chair Anthony Scoma is not present. Dr. Russell Barty. Present. Dr. Jody Elder. Present. George Francis IV, not present. Ms. Evelyn Hudson Thompson. Present. Daniel Parrish. Present. Janine Smith. Present. Chaplain Richmond Stoglin, not present. You have a quorum. Okay. Um, Mr. Spear, are there any announcements that need to be made beforehand? Um, no. However, uh, you will need to uh, have a motion and a vote to uh, uh, excuse the absences of those board members not attending, uh, if you so choose. Um, okay. Otherwise, you would have to unexcuse. Um, may does anybody would anybody like to make a uh, motion to excuse the board members? Okay, uh, Dr. Barty, um, Dr. Elder is a second. Um, all those in favor, um, raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. So um, those board members are um, hereby excused from the meeting. Okay, let's just jump straight into our agenda. Um, agenda item number one is approval of our minutes from the July 22nd uh, board meeting. Um, has everybody had a chance to review those? Are there any changes or discussion? I make a motion to accept as written. Okay, Dr. Elder made a motion, Dr. Barty seconded. All those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Okay, agenda item uh, number three, um, board review and possible action regarding appeals. Um, I did not see any of those in our board packet. Likewise, I did not see anything for agenda items number four and five, um, which moves us on to agenda item number six, report of agreed orders um, executed by the council's executive director. Um, is there any discussion over any of these items? Okay, um, then do we need to remind me, I'm sorry, do we need to make a motion to accept the report? Okay, then we'll just move on um, to agenda item number, what are we on? Seven, report of cases dismissed by the council's executive director. Um, is there any discussion here? Uh, yes, Dr. Elder. Um, so I had a question because um, the I think this is the first time I've ever seen it listed by a case corrective action taken. Can you explain what that means? Sure. Um, I don't know the specifics on that actual case, but the question might be, or the issue might be, um, there was an, they were advertising something and it was um, something, something was wrong. And then they, we, we alerted them to that and they immediately changed it, apologized, didn't, you know, it was one of those like, I didn't realize that was a problem. We took corrective action and fixed it. And so since they fixed the problem, it didn't feel like it was um, if one of those things, sort of like an innocent, innocent mistake, if it, they corrected it and then we can move on. So that that kind of, I don't know the vac exact facts, but I think that's probably something along those lines. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. So keep in mind that the dismissals were reviewed by the ethics committee. And so they've gone through all of the dismissals just uh, giving them the once over. Okay. Um, then let's move on. Any well, any further discussion? Okay. Then we'll move on to agenda item number eight, status report of quarterly uh, enforcement case activities. Any discussion here? I just okay. want to say that um, I really love the fact that the older cases are disappearing. I mean, those numbers are so low and that backlog is being cleared up and kudos to the staff and investigations and all of those people who are working so hard to get that done. Yes, for sure. Um, okay, um, agenda item number nine, um, report of compliance with agreed orders. Um, any conver any discussion on agenda item number nine? Then we'll move on to um, agenda item number 10. Um, since um, uh, Mr. Francis is not here, um, we are going to skip agenda item number 10. Perhaps if Mr. Uh, Francis shows up, we will um, come back to this agenda item. Um, but for now, we're going to skip it. 
Um, agenda item number 11, um, report from the committee chairs. Um, so, oh shoot, um, I forgot that Reverend Chair, or yeah, Reverend uh, Dr. Scoma was not going to be here. Um, so I can go ahead and give the ethics committee report. It's pretty short. We met, we reviewed the cases um, that had been dismissed and um, it was a really helpful, informative meeting. Um, I don't know. And staff is doing an amazing job. So they are working through cases and they are, I don't know, they're doing great. And that's, I don't know, that's my report. Any questions about that? I just appreciate that we as a board have eyes on it. I mean, I trust what the staff is doing, but we're also mm -hmm. signing off on it as board members. So I like the fact that there are board members who are at least looking at what's being done. Yeah. Thank you to the ethics committee for their work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, let me do licensing standards committee. Um, we um, did not meet, um, so we can skip agenda item number 11B. Um, 11C, report from the outreach, uh, outreach committee. The outreach committee, we did meet. Um, there are minutes in your um, board packet. Um, any questions about the board minutes? Yeah, Dr. Elder. Um, so it said that there could possibly be a lunch event that was scheduled for Friday, November 4th. I'm wondering, was that scheduled? Is that something we're moving forward with? We actually um, are going to move that to December 4th, I believe is the date that we okay. picked. Um, well, okay. So I think what happened was um, we all forgot that we had said we're going to do November 4th. And so we made absolutely no arrangements to make that happen. Just in complete honesty. Um and so we met on Monday, I met with uh, Sarah and Daryl and um, Tim, and we went ahead and set a tentative date of the first Friday in December, which is that December 4th? Is that the right date or December 2nd? I got to find it's my calendar. December 2nd. December 2nd. Um, so I will, I, will, I will be there. Um, is there anybody else who would be available and would like to join, um, join us on that date for, okay, uh, Ms. Smith? And Ms. Elder, or Dr. Elder. Um, Dr. Barti, do you want to as well? Sure. Okay. Um, well, then the four of us can do it. The way that it worked last time is um, beforehand, like we just basically did like a rules update. We just kind of updated on some of the things that were happening in the board. Um, we did it kind of two different ways. Sarah had prepared some scripts. And so um, some people just kind of read their scripts. Um, I'm not really good at reading scripts, so I just talked, um, but we can do it. You can do it however you want to, however you want to do it, but, um, let's put the four of us down for doing that lunch and learn. Um, I will come up with an agenda of what we're going to talk about that day. And then we can, I can assign y'all things and y'all can either, um, have, you can either write a script or you can talk about it freehand, whatever you want to do. So, um, is that just, a, a, a 12 to one or what's the 12 to one? Yeah. Okay. Good. And I just want to volunteer that um, thanks to you, Dr. Merchant, for giving me kind of the draft of the update for MFT, because I use that in a recent presentation for supervisors. Excellent. Dr. Barti and I are going to use that same kind of format for the TCA conference presentation coming up. So if you want, I could shoot you back what we use in November, mm -hmm. in early November, and you could use that as a format if you want, just to kind of go okay. through that for that lunch hour. That might just save you some trouble. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. That'd be great. And we'll probably just, we'll probably pare it down, you know, mm -hmm. to just like, you know, maybe four right. basic points or something. Cause I think last time what we did is we did about half an hour of, Hey, this is what's coming up. And then we did a half hour of just Q and a, um, where they could just ask us whatever questions. And I think it went well. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Parrish, Ms. Smith, y'all were both there and it went pretty well, right? It did. Yeah. I thought it, so too. it went well. Yeah, yeah. It's well received. This kind I of stuff is very well received. I think yeah. the main thing is for us being available to licensees yeah. and public to just be answering questions and interact with them makes a huge difference. So I'm all about it. Okay, um, let's move on to um, agenda uh, agenda item 11D, report from the Professional Developmental Committee. Um, Ms. Husband thompson um, We did not meet since our last um, meeting, but I did have some agenda points with Sarah that she took care of that we had discussed in our previous meeting on for the uh, chair prudence exam. Okay. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I just want to say I appreciate the fact that Ms. Vazholtz is always so diligent about updating the JP exam as soon as we change the rules. All of these changes, if not 
most, if not all, are the new rules that we passed. So I appreciate her staying on top of that. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see here. Um, agenda item uh, E, a report from the Rules Committee. Um, normally that would be Mr. Francis. Um, who, uh, Dr. Elder, you're on the Rules Committee, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you want to, um, would you be willing to maybe talk a little bit about what y'all talked about or do you just wanna kind of jump into the rules that y'all, like we can just move on with the agenda or if you'd like to give a report? Um, you know, just basically that we referred some things back for further study rather than implementing rules. We referred it back for let's go look and get some information about it, meaning like the crisis intervention kind of um, CE. And that's on the agenda later on. So I think yeah. everything we covered in our meeting is on the agenda later. Okay, cool. Okay. Any, any questions about any of these or any further discussion about anything under 11 before we move on to 12? Okay. Um, agenda item number 12, discussion and possible action regarding rules committee report for board approval to inform, um, to informally gather stakeholder input concerning crisis intervention experience and related continuing education. Um, I guess, um, I guess maybe Jody, who else is, was on the rules committee who discussed this? Okay. Doglin, Chaplain Stoglin. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Okay. Well, Dr. Elder, Miss, uh, Miss Husband Thompson, um, would y'all just kind of maybe give us a summary of kind of what your intent or your thought or like how y'all came to um, wanting to do this? Uh, is Evelyn, do you want to say anything? Or go ahead, Patrick. What do you want to? It, I, I don't want to step on your toes if you want to go ahead and, uh, and and talk about it. But I think the question that was being raised was they a lot of people thought they'd like to potentially require it, but they didn't want to dictate too many hours, basically not giving people the freedom to choose different types of courses that they, they could take. And so before just implementing a rule and requiring uh, these these sorts of things, they thought, let's let's gather informal uh, input from stakeholders, from licensees. And so I think Sarah's kind of built out yeah. sort of some of the questions to um, to to ask it or, or some of the information to send out for a call for information. And then based on that input, we could come back and either add it to the, the CE rule or tweak it or not add it. But that was kind of the the discussion was you know, they wanted to, they wanted to, they thought it was important that people get training in it, but they didn't also want to basically dictate every single hour that they're taking. And you're, it's starting, the more you add, the, the closer it gets to that. So I would say that's an accurate reflection of the process. Yeah. How many hours are dictated right now? I know six are ethics, three are um, diversity, diversity. Uh -huh. and then three would be crisis management if we added it, two are telehealth, one is the JP for supervisors. Um, so for supervisors, 18 of the hours are required. Um, mm -hmm. If we added crisis management, a three hour, it would be 21 of the 30 CEs are absolutely required for supervisors who do telehealth. For just, if you're not a supervisor, if we added the three hours of crisis management, what we came up with is that you would have 12 of the 30 hours that would be required in specific content areas. Could we just require one hour of um, crisis? I think make that is what, way? I think that's what Mrs. Smith has intimated will be coming down the pike anyway from the legislature, yeah. possibly in the next legislative session. Um, and we talked about, let's just wait on passing this rule to see yeah. if it even comes down. If it's mandated, then we're spinning our wheels for no good reason. Right. See, it's kind of yeah. my feeling too. So I wasn't sure if we, I guess whenever I was looking at the, the survey is I wasn't sure what we would do with this information. Like once we had it, would this help us make a decision about whether we're going to do one hour or three hours? Um, and then I just feel like, again, the legislature is probably going to deal with this. So I'm not sure that I don't know. A part of me wonders if we should just wait until we know what the legislature is going to do. Honestly, I'm okay with waiting. I think there were, there's some really, this information is kind of helpful just for us to see what's out there, but there's a lot of open-ended kind of fill in the blank paragraph fields that I think would just be too much data. Uh, if we yeah. do this survey, I would be more in favor of paring it down and adding a question that's like, would you be in favor of adding a crisis management CE requirement? And if so, how many hours do you think would be appropriate to add? I think that question should be on there. Mm -hmm. Ms. Smith? Yes, 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I had a question. If we broadened our cultural diversity to cultural competency, could an hour um, be used under this? Because our culture has become where there are crises and it will continue to have some crisis, whether it is man-made or natural weather disasters. Um, I, I'm just curious if there's a possibility if we broadened our cultural diversity into cultural competency, that this would also fall underneath there. Just a thought. I feel like um, that would actually be kind of a, oh, that made me dark. Um, hold on, I'm rearranging. Since there's nobody here and I'm in this room, I'm gonna try to get a little bit more comfortable. Um, so, that background's better. Is it? Yeah, okay. yeah, we can see, got, I can see you better. Well, it's kind of a Hollywood background, so. <laughs> With the stars, it makes it look like yeah, yeah. Those yeah. um, encounters. Yeah, so I feel like um, I feel like that would be somewhat of a stretch. However, I wouldn't mind expanding ethics to include crisis intervention. Um, mm -hmm. That's what we do, honestly, here at ACU. Is um, our students' ability to handle and manage a crisis is counted under um, like their part of their ethics grade. Mm -hmm. um, so I could see that stretch going that way, and since they have to get six hours. You know what I mean? Like, if right. they yeah. those... instead of saying, okay, now human trafficking, now suicide, now this, now this, now this, can we have the definitions that are underneath there, whether it's ethics or uh, cultural or whatever it is, maybe broaden those definitions a little bit to where those hours are already included and they can pick and use it in one of those labels instead of continuing to say, yeah, we're going to have you add more, 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 more and the choices get less and less and less and less. Well, and and I'm I'm leaning toward reducing the the line item requirements because I I don't know to what extent that's going to require staff to go line item to verify here here's 3 hours for this or here's 2 hours for this, here's 1 hour for this during over all those 30 hours. Mm -hmm. I I I would go with what the legislature is requiring and then make strong suggestions that as you're collecting your CEs, consider getting CEs in this category, this category, this category, which would include crisis because not all LMFTs are going to want to do crisis interventions. But I think those that are that have that on their heart to step into that domain, that they're going to seek those CEs and get the training for that. So I'm I'm leaning more toward reducing the line items and, and leaving a little bit more freedom uh, for, for the licensees to pursue the CEs that are not going to be required by, by state legislature. So it sounds like maybe what we're... Oh, go ahead, Dr. Elder. No, I was just going to say, I agree. First of all, I would absolutely agree with leaving as much discretion as possible to the licensee to choose yeah. what fits their practice, but also... I think we just need to wait, table this, see what the legislature does. And then if it's still important to us, bring it back up after the legislative session is over. I agree. And then maybe consider at that time, whether we just expand ethics to include crisis management or, or not. So, um, okay. Do we need to make a motion for that? Or can we just, we discussed and we can move on. I guess we're going to table it until we hear okay. from Let's, this, would, uh, legislature. Would anybody... is it... Would somebody like to make a motion to table this until after the legislative after the legislative session is over? Okay, I've have a, okay. Daryl, Daryl, did you have a comment or? Well, I was just going to say you don't need a motion. You can just okay. take no action on it and move on. Okay. you can always pick it up anytime else. Okay, anytime I like to withdraw my motion to make a <laughs> okay. motion. Okay, I like that. Okay, then let's move on to agenda item number thirteen. Um, that is discussion and possible action. I'm concerning recommendations um, from the rules committee. So um, agenda item number A is uh, regarding the temporary license. Um, so just as kind of a little bit of, um, there we have two rules that we're looking at here and I'm gonna tell you one of one of the rules came out of the rules committee. So um, when Dr. Elder, Ms. Husband Thompson um, and the other members met, that's the rule that they produced. Um, I had actually forgotten that I had asked y'all to take that up. And so when I was in um, at AMFTRB, 
um, Daryl and I had a conversation and I was like, and that, that was one of the things they talked about at AMF TRB was temporary licenses. licenses. And so I had suggested to Daryl that we create a rule about um, that has the 90 days. And so instead of 30 in consecutive days, 30 consecutive or 90 consecutive days. Um, and then when we got back, we realized that we had actually already asked the rule committee or the rules committee to address this. So that's how we ended up with two different rules. Um, and so they are both on the table for us to discuss um, whether we even want to do a temporary license. Um, if we do want a temporary license, we've got two options before us. We can do 30 non-consecutive days across the entire year, or we can do 90 consecutive days um, just at one point in the year. So Dr. Elder. Yeah. And then. Maybe. Oh, and then Dr. Barty. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm absolutely in favor of having a temporary license available. I think that for not only for client welfare of continuity of care, even if they're not our clients, um, I really believe that we need to be offering this temporary practice in Texas. We need to get on board with reciprocity in any way that we possibly can with other states. Otherwise, we're going to starve in this profession because the other professions are way ahead of us. And this is, I see a great step in that direction. I think this is a way for us as a state to regulate the practice of other people in our state because it's already happening. Yeah, They're just not under our jurisdiction because they don't have a license here. So offering the temporary license gives us a way to regulate the practice and make sure they're adhering to our rules. Um, and then I wanna finish with a question. I'm curious what y'all see as the pros and cons of the 30 over a year versus the 90 consecutive. Cause to me, I don't, I don't really understand the implications of that difference. Right. Um, do you want me to, and Dr. Barty, do you uh, want oh. to jump in and then I can answer that question or. Do uh, you well, uh, well, uh, mine is going to go a little bit with that because I think the two things that I have, the, the temporary license thing, I like that a lot because in doing teletherapy across other states, there are other states that says you can have 15 days, you can have 30 days, you can have 20 days. And to me, that seems nice, thank you, but a little bit loosey-goosey. I mean, how, do, how, how is that tracked? And I like the idea of us saying, if you want to do that in Texas, we're going to watch it. We're going to, we're going to contain it. And there will be parameters. You will need to apply. You will need to be accepted with that. And then there's going to be parameters. So I really like the idea of opening up uh, people from other states who are coming to Texas for the continuity of care to be able to do that and to tighten it up with a temporary license. Now, for me, I think the 30 days versus, for a year or versus 90 consecutive days has to do with the purpose of the temporary license. If the purpose is to do therapy outside of outside of the state over a period of time, and you just want to do that because your client is wanting to do that, I'm I'm not a big fan of that yet. And, and we'll see how you know compacts come and stuff. But if somebody's moving to Texas and you want to ensure continuity of care and handoff, a, a nice warm handoff, I think the 90 day is the better way to go because it time limits. Mm -hmm. So temporary license with 90 days provides a structure that I think is going to be more easily overseen and managed and, and clarified. Yes, that's why I was in favor. That's why I came. That's how I came with the 90 days as well as I thought about what's the purpose of this. Um, and really, for me, it's about continuity of care and wanting to make sure that if like, well, two, 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 one, if a client moves to Texas, this gives, again, the client 90 days to maybe get in somewhere. Or if like a college student is home for summer break, you know, mm -hmm. they would be able to see that college student while they're home for, for college, you know, for the entire summer. Um, whereas if somebody is using 30 days spread out across the entire year, I just feel like if you're seeing somebody in Texas for an entire year, you just need a Texas license. Like if you're going to have a client who is mm -hmm. here on vacation, you know, if they're, maybe they're in Texas every other week, then you just need to have a Texas license to see them here every other week. You know, right. you no, know, that's kind of my I don't know. I just feel like if somebody's going to practice here for an entire year, they need a license as opposed to if they have a client who's going to be here in the short term. Yeah. The 90 days would cover if a client's here on vacation for a week. It would cover, again, these transitions, you know, if somebody moving to Texas or home for spring break or home for summer break. So that was why I was, I recommended the 90 days. Yeah. Okay. Other discussion? Uh, 
Oops, sorry. Oh. Let me do Miss Smith and then we'll okay. do Daryl. Oh, I was just pointing that Daryl has his hand up. Oh, I'm and sorry, Daryl. He's next to me on the Hollywood Squares. Okay, he's to the, my left, so I missed him. Anyways, uh, Mr. Spinks. Um, okay, the, the two things. Uh, one, on the debate between 30 and the 90, I, I understand what y'all are saying about how it seems like a misuse of the license if somebody can use non-consecutive days to effectively practice for an entire year and stay on temporary license. I understand that concern. But one of the things you got to keep in mind is not all your folks are going to be using this for a clinical or a therapeutic relationship. You guys do get involved in litigation and court cases, and you're going to have you may have to come to Texas. And I'm telling you right now, depositions wreak havoc in court court cases, court dates wreak havoc on temporary licensees. Um, site board started out with a temporary license a long time ago that had a fixed, I think, 30 day requirement. That didn't work. I mean, it doesn't work well. Uh, now, psych is involved in a lot. You know, a lot of those folks are involved in litigation, maybe more so than MFTs, but y'all are going to be in it. I mean, you're you're going to have that pop up. His, history has just shown us that the 30 non-consecutive day allowance is just more flexible. It, it just provides a more flexible approach. It provides less stress on staff because people aren't having to come back to us and constantly readjust when that 90 day period is. Um, now I, I can't remember if this 90 day period rule requires them to tell us in advance when they're going to be doing it or if it's an after the fact, but just, just be mindful of that when you're selecting it. Don't look at it just from a therapeutic standpoint. There is going to be a forensic standpoint for you guys as well. Uh, and, or it may just be, it may not even be forensic. It may be uh, if you have to come here, if they have to come here to do an evaluation of somebody and then go back to their home state and wrap things up, dates change life gets in the way so just keep that in mind and then so, the last go ahead uh, and the last thing I, I would say is um on the temporary license i mean look look i'm a bit I, i'm 100 behind the rule i like the idea i think y'all need to do it you certainly got statutory authority to do it i want you to do it i want y'all to have this um i just want to manage your expectations about how fast we can do something like this um, right now, we're coming out of a regulatory, a, a configuration freeze on the database. So am I going to want to start uh, creating a new new license in the database? No, not right now. And I've got legislative session coming up. Am I going to want to be fooling with this during that? No. The only, what I'm just trying to tell you is if we do this, practically speaking, between the rulemaking process and just time availability of me and Ms. Nowak, who's going to handle a lot of the database issues, it's going to be mid to late next year before we could get something like this actually implemented. That's not dragging our feet, but the rulemaking alone will take that long to get done. So um, I just want to kind of manage expectations, especially the public watching everybody getting excited going, oh, yeah, we're going to have a temporary license. Yeah, well, you know, towards the end of 2023, you will have it probably. Yes, sir. Uh, but I just anyway, I just want to put that out there. Okay. Um, let me hear from Ms. Smith and then Dr. Barty, and then does somebody else have a comment? Okay, well, let's go uh, Ms. Smith. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Spinks, I wanted to ask, how does the staff track it? Does anybody track these 30 days? Does anybody really care? How, how does that work for your, uh, for the staff's thing? number one. And number two, I'm glad that you caution the people that are listening that things can't be done quickly. But I also still think it's important for us to be um, letting letting our, our licensees know that we are concerned about portability. We understand how far behind we are on this topic. And so anything we can do to continue that conversation, I think is important. But I, I am curious, how did you guys uh, deal with this with the staff? Well, psych board is, is really the only, uh, the only model we have to look at because they're the only ones with a true temporary license right now. And originally it was a block 30 days and you had to tell us what those were. And it was, it was, this, it was this constant back and forth. Oh, something's changed. I need to move it. Or I've used part of my time. Can I use, I mean, you get into these discussions about I've used part of my 30 days. Can I move the rest of the 30 days to someplace else? And there's a lot of back and forth involved and it eats up a lot of time. Plus, it's you almost have to have a dedicated calendar just to track who's who's 
who's authorized to practice when here and that is a gigantic pain in the rear uh, because you may have hundreds of people with a temporary license at a given time practicing in the state or eligible to practice in the state then psych moved to we'll do uh, non-consecutive days but we didn't we didn't get smart and we didn't remove the element to seek approval prior to coming to the state it, it's weird to say we're going to give you a license to practice but before you do you got to tell us and get permission to actually practice so we were doubling up on the work uh, for us and that was a complete disaster uh it just swamped us with emails um, and, and it just didn't work that was not a good idea now we have moved to a, a model where and we've modeled it after cypac their their temporary practice permit where we give it to you the fact that you're licensed we're going to trust you you could do this for 30 days you pick the days and then once your license is over once your 30 days is up or your license is over you have to report back to us and tell us when you practiced. And then that removes the onus on staff to keep track of that. Now, the weak link in that admittedly is you don't know till after the fact. But, you know, again, we're a complaint driven entity. So if there was a problem and somebody complains, we can always deal with it then. That's how we would have to deal with it anyway. Um, so, uh, yeah, I always tell boards and the council, I'm like, don't ever forget, everybody puts a lot of stock in what do we can what can we do on the front end to make sure the public is protected? Don't ever forget, you got a big stick over here that you can hit them with, and that has a deterrent effect. So don't be afraid to wag that at them and go, if you don't, if you do this wrong, I'm gonna whack you with this. Um, so anyway, that that's been our experience, and that's I I would not want to see y'all kind of repeat psych board's mistakes on that and take us back to that same kind of a model. Thank you. Thanks for answering that. I just had that question. Thank you. Dr. Elder? Oh, we know Dr. Barty and then Dr. Elder. Well, uh, Mr. Spinks, you, you may have addressed mine. I was wondering if we do like a 90 day and there is a forensic thing or there is an exception, uh, would would we build in that if you wanted an extension or if you wanted an exception, you could reapply if if you give just cause or something like that but what you, what i heard you saying is you don't want to have to be put in the position of having to you know take a look at this one then take a look at that one then take after after it's already been established is that correct i mean it's a bureaucratic quagmire with all yeah. of that and, yeah, and okay you, i get that i, I right. don't like the idea of allowing for extensions for good cause because that that's just more administrative stuff that we have to deal with because yeah. everybody's going to think that they have good cause and they're going to hammer us on that. It, it doesn't help us. It, it doesn't make it efficient. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Elder. I guess I just want to make sure I'm understanding is that people would come to us and apply for this temporary license. If, as long as we could verify, they could give us verification. They were in good standing and fully licensed in another jurisdiction. We would say, sure, you have, 30 days over the course of a year. And it's kind of the honor system for them to tell us, I've used up my 30 days and here's what they were. Um, and then the other piece of that is, why do we even need to know what days they practice? It seems like, how does that benefit us as a governing board to keep up with all those minutia? If we're just gonna use the honor system, they just have to come back and say, okay, I used all my 30 days, see you next year. It doesn't. But it, it's one of those, it's one of those deals. When we presented it to Psych Board, we really didn't think we could sell. Just hey, this is an honor-based system. Uh, we figured they would want some sort of accountability on the back end, and it's the it's in a form of accountability with the least impact on uh, a staff, and really on the licensee mm -hmm. too. Uh, the only just, way that I can see it would benefit us is if there was any kind of ethical complaint, we would have the data to say, here's when they said they were practicing right. and maybe they practiced on a day that they didn't report. But I mean, I don't know. It just seems like a lot of staff time eaten up to collect that data when really it's an honor system tried and true. That's what it is. And, and, and what, what would be the, if, if, if they used 40 days, what, what do we do? We, we we say, shame on you for using more than what were allocated. I mean, we're are, are there any teeth to this? Because I, I appreciate what Dr. Elder's saying. This is this is we're we're trying to cooperate with with outside therapists, but the verification 
do do we want to police that? Do we want to oversee the minutia? And and that's where I like the 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 start and finish. Let, let's just give them ninety days, and and it starts. You can see them as often as you want, and at the end of the ninety days, it expires, and and that's it. Dr. Bartib raises a good point. I, you know, if temporary licensees are a little bit, uh, a little different animal from just a regular licensee, uh, although psych board has sanctioned temporary licensees, we've stripped them of their license and kept them from coming back. Um, what would you do if somebody practiced for 40 days? Well, they're probably going to get a cease and desist from us. I don't know that we can do anything to the license because at that point it's expired and we don't have any jurisdiction over them anymore. We could probably do a cease and desist. Um, which might then come back to haunt them in their home state, uh, because if the home state finds out that we've done a cease and, I, and I'm not sure, I don't know if a cease and desist would be reportable to NPDB. I'd love to figure out a way where we could upload it or tell NPDB about it, because then their home state yes. will find out about it. Yes, uh, and there will be there will be a reckoning on that. Um, but I'd have to look and see what the law is on that. If NPDB would cover something like, I suspect they would but I'd have to check and see. But you're right, Dr. Martin, that is a weak link, I, I will admit. But that's a weak link. It doesn't matter whether it's MFT, site board, or whoever. That's just an inherent problem with temporary licensure, that issue. I just feel like there's less opportunity to take advantage of the rule if it's 90 consecutive days as opposed to 30 days spread out over the year. Because like you said, as everybody's kind of pointed out, there's no... It's all in the honor system. Whereas if it's 90 consecutive days, we know when they began, we know when they, when those 90 days were up. And so anything outside of that is unlicensed practice. And so it just seems like it's easier to, I just like the, the clearer boundaries of the 90 days. I don't know. Dr. Elder. Um, I agree that I like the clear boundary of the 90 days because it's clear when you're doing unlicensed practice, but at the same time, I want us to consider the fact that this is so important and we want it to move forward in a way that requires the least amount of staff time. Because right. if we're saddling staff with too much work, this will go away because we're all about streamlining and efficiency. And mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, because of that mere fact, I don't want staff to be saddled with, well, I use my 90 days, I need more. Or can I stop now and use the rest of it later? I, I mean, I would be okay with just that 30 day over a year honor system report to us back what you used. And if they go over, I like what Mr. Spink said about, well, we could do a cease and desist. And then we have that on our records. So if they apply again, we can go, mm, no, you didn't really follow our rules last time. Yeah. It also seems like if they want to go over their 90 days, then we say, well, then apply for a Texas license. You've been practicing here for three months. You know, just get a get a Texas license. It's one hundred and forty dollars, and I don't know. There's that's a good point. Mr. Oh, Hyde, are you raising their hand? No, Mr. Hyde Patrick. is. Oh, Patrick. Okay, Patrick. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm blind today. Apparently, go ahead, <laughs> or Mr. Hyde. I, I just a quick clarifying question. If you go with the ninety day option. The way it's written right now in the, propo the, the proposal that's drafted is basically says once it's issued, you can the, the temporary license holder can choose when to start the 90 days uh, because the processing time, you're not sure, you know, is it going to be a week or is it going to be a couple of days? It, it, if it starts at 90 day clock, it didn't seem fair, but Based on your discussion, I'm not sure if that was what you guys are intending is to allow them to start the 90 days. Would, like if they know somebody's coming for the summer, so they apply two months ahead to have that so they can start it. Or do you want it based on once it's actually been processed and issued? That would be that would it would need to change the language. So that's why I just wanted to if you go that option, I wanted to be clear as to what it is you guys were wanting. I would think that it would start the date of their first session. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't make it start dependent upon the start date dependent upon when we get it processed that is not fair to the applicant at all yeah, because if agree. something something happens on our end that that can really screw them over so yeah i didn't think, i yeah. agree i didn't think it would be I, li I like the way the rule is set where they can pick yeah. it um 
I, I, I like this robust discussion and I think it's gonna be interesting to continue to watch and, and see just a little bit. Um, I, I can understand the feeling of security of giving them 90 days because it's a stop and start date. But if there's a fear that they're going to misuse it by being given an amount of days within the year, um, we, we already trust a lot of what we do. And we end up punishing after we find out they didn't do it well, but we give them that trust uh, so I don't see why this wouldn't be different in what we already do with our licensees within the state. So it's just something to, to think about um, that if I came in and I said, I want a temporary license and uh, they're, they're explaining the rules of this is what's going to happen and you get these 30 days. And if you have decided that when you look at it, that you have practiced 65, then we're going to find out about that and it's going to be not good for you. So it's really incumbent upon you to be the upright and ethical person that you're supposed to be as a therapist. And so um, I, I, I think I would be in favor of what they've already tried and, and it has been shown to work better than the stop start. Just my two cents on it. I guess May, may I say something, Dr. Elder, then I'll come back to you. I guess one of my concerns is that I think if I were a, um, I don't know, I don't know, if I were a slick therapist or something, and I lived in a border town, I think I would use this to be able to practice across state lines um, for an entire year without getting a license. Um, you, you could, be, the same thing would happen if you, once you got your license, just because you have this imaginary 90 day stoppage, if yeah. you're a slick, unethical therapist, what, 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 nobody's going to, you know, the therapy police are not going to be knocking on your door at day 91 going yeah. one day over. So we have to be realistic about how we can monitor this as well. Well, but I think, I just feel like the 30 days over the year would just make it easier for people to be able to practice an entire year in Texas, year after year after year without ever getting a Texas license. Right, because because 30, 30 sessions is different from um, what um, four, eight, 12 sessions, ninety days, 12, 15 sessions. Top. Well, the uh, we can maybe mitigate that by how much a temporary license is going to cost year after year. If the first year they apply and it's this cost. And then the next year they apply for another 30 days and the cost has gone up. It's just as, it's just as cheap to apply for a full license. Yeah. So there, I mean, there are stop gaps that, that we can do on that. You know, we don't have to decide today, but I, I do love hearing the discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, let me do and, Dr. Sorry. sorry. Uh, Dr. Let me hear from Dr. Elder. She had her hand up first and then Dr. Bertie. Yeah. Um, so I think what, what y'all said answered my question in my head, 30 non-consecutive days is almost a year, once a week. That's, that's 30 weeks potentially out of mm -hmm. what, how many weeks a year, 52 weeks a year. So that's almost an entire year. And if you have a yep. client you're seeing every two weeks, that is a full year of practicing with a client while they're in Texas. Um, so that's, I would not be in favor of allowing that kind of practice over consecutive years, just because that, I, I agree with you, Dr. Merchant, that's allowing them to basically practice in Texas without having a Texas license. So maybe we put a limit on the number of years they can do it or do what Ms. Smith said, which is make it the fees exorbitant. So they're more motivated to go ahead and get a Texas license. But I would be concerned about that possibility. Dr. Barty? Yeah, just a clarifying question, uh, Mr. Spinks. From the administrative perspective, is there a preference? Because I like what Dr. Elder said. We don't want to put a, a, an undue burden on staff and things. Is, is, is there a preference from staff as to maybe from administrating all of this that you would lean one way or the other? Well, uh, let me say, I think both your options before you are good options. So I, I, don't, I don't think y'all are picking from bad 
you're not fishing in bad water here. Either one's a good way to go. Um, my preference is the 30 days. I get what y'all are talking about now. I, I don't ever see the good thing about having debates like this is you guys really flesh stuff out and this helps staff understand how y'all see and view things for future issues. It also helps the public, but see, we never had debates like this at psych board on this particular issue on, on this 30 days. How does that translate into a, you know, gosh, that's actually seeing a patient for a whole year. I don't ever remember hearing this discussion come up. It's because so this, we're family therapists. <laughs> we're system we're, therapists. We're better. <laughs> Y'all are more wait, awesomer. <laughs> oh, wait, is my mic, is, do I have a live mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> so my preference because of comfort level is the way Psych has done it. I know it. It hasn't proven to be a problem over at Psych. Uh, the, these concerns that y'all are talking about has not, have not shown up, but I also have to admit, psych is a different animal from y'all. Uh, a lot of the folks that use this for psych, you see two you see two groups: the forensic folks, big users of the temporary license. I don't know that you're going to see that as much with y'all. No. And then, but you also see the therapists with college uh, age kids that are coming down here, and and that's to me those are the two big ones that I've seen. Um, y'all are going to see that probably you're going to see more of that stuff um maybe maybe military families too to some degree until they get transitioned to somebody else but my preference just because i'm used to it i know how it works i've seen it work is the the 30 days but again you got two good choices here so don't you're not going to go wrong either way you go dr elder um so i'm curious to hear what action other boards in the BHEC system are taking other than psych on this issue? Because I know that being streamlined is a big deal. So I'm just curious what the other boards are considering. Nothing. Um, the, the problem with counseling and social work, social work's temporary license is virtually useless because of the way the statute is worded. It just is not, it doesn't work. It's, it's bad. LPCs have used their temporary license. That is what they use to do the LPC associate license. They have used that statutory authority to create the associate license. They do not have a true temporary license like what y'all, y'all have a standalone statute for a true temporary license, and that's all you're using it for. The LPCs have not. We would have to, we'd have to like double dip read that statute in two different ways to give us authority to do two different completely functions. I'm not sure we can do that. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know what the law is on that. I've never, I've never seen that done before. I, I've honestly been quiet on it until now because I just didn't want to have to deal with that issue. <laughs> that issue. But I, when y'all started talking about it, I figured it was eventually come up for the tip for the LPCs, but um, so y'all be quiet for a little while Get, let us let us have a breath of fresh air before we bring that issue up over there dr barty yeah just one other thing if we go with the 30 days and, and for a year other states that i've worked with in in doing teletherapy and stuff don't have 30 days the the most i've seen were 20 i've seen 15 is there a possibility that we could reduce the potential abuse by reducing the number from 30 down to 15 and 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 treat it truly as temporary and and not necessarily infer that this is you know uh, something that can be used over the entire year and and reduce it from 15 uh, from 30 down to 15 yeah, that might be an option too. That that's a, again, that's an option that I don't ever remember psych board talking about. The 30 was just something that you just it gets ingrained in you historically. You're like, oh, it's always been. And so they never really touched upon the 30 as that rule evolved over time. It yeah. just stayed the same. It was how it was distributed, is what the debate or the discussion was about. Yeah. And the most I've seen has been 15. I've seen seven, I've seen 10, and I've seen 15. I haven't seen anything more than that during the the covid emergency you know rules and things along those lines i think there are some 20 and 30s out there are there are there yeah are there there are, there are 20 and 30s out for there. for therapies I, or for, uh, yeah well okay. in like psych uh okay i, I don't want to say i've seen it in some other professions at amf trb they talked about i think it was indiana and colorado both do 30 
Okay. So, uh, Dr. Elder, did you have your hand up? I did. I was just going to say that um, I would, I mean, when you do the math, 15 is a summer if you're doing it once a week. And if you have a client who's out of state and you need to see them twice a week, you should probably transfer care if they need that intensive care. Right. Um, so for me, 15 or 20 feels a little more comfortable than the 30. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. I could feel, I could do, I would feel comfortable with 15 because I think that would enable, again, if you want to do more than 15 days, you just have to get a license. You need to just get a permanent license. Right. And so, um, yeah, so I would feel more comfortable with 15 than 30 for sure. Okay. Do we have any further discussion? Does somebody want to make a motion? Dr. Barty? Yes, I'll make a motion that we accept the uh, the the thirty day approach with the change of thirty days to fifteen days. Okay. But re remember, or, I mean, it's fine. We can go ahead and make the motion. Y'all can vote on how you want the rules structured. But as far as moving forward with it right now, this goes back to that managing expectations. Understand, I'm not going to be able to do anything with this for a while, so. Right. I, I won't even take it to the council until I kind of get my ducks in a row and I'm ready to go on it. That's fine. Do we need okay. to make it a part of the motion, Daryl? Um, no, okay, Tim says do we no. Even, do we even need a motion or do we just say, okay, good discussion and no, you don't, we don't need a motion yet? We well, need yeah, a, I mean, y'all tell we, me. Go ahead, Chair Mercer. I think we need a motion. We just need to recognize that Daryl's not going to be able to take it to BHEC for probably several months, that it'll be probably after the legislative session before this goes through BHEC and it'll be next year before we, we get something. Dr. Elder? I know that um, I think this is an important point for us to make some type of movement on, even if it is, yes, we are moving toward it. We're just kind of in a stall because at the recent supervisor training I did, the MFTs in the room said, LPC, I'm duly licensed, LPC, LMFT. And if the counseling compact goes through, I'm going to drop my LMFT license because I can't, you, I can't participate in the counseling compact if I have an LMFT because that's the more restrictive license. They wouldn't be able to practice across state lines as an LPC because how are you going to decide, oh, right now I'm acting as an LPC, not an LMFT. So they were intending to drop their LMFT license if the counseling compact goes through. And I thought, oh Lord, are we gonna lose people in droves because they feel like they'd rather have the LPC than the LMFT. And so I think we need to make some movement, even if it is a motion to say, we completely support this, at least temporary license movement toward reciprocity. I will say if somebody has told them that, they've got some bad advice. Um, yeah, I didn't realize that myth or rumor was floating around out there that's mm -hmm. that's terrible advice um mm -hmm. we can address so anybody that. yeah anybody listening in the audience y'all don't be buying that you mean people uh, misunderstand things yeah what uh, we'll have to address that at our lunch and learn um so somebody remind me to address that at our lunch and learn that we don't that that you can be an lmft and still participate in the uh the compact well and this will be good because as we solidify this when uh, dr elder and i are at the tca conference right in the camp uh we can we can clarify it also at mm -hmm. that point and that'll be good yeah okay. so I, I guess my motion is uh, let's let's go with the thirty day option, but reduce it to fifteen. Is that can can we do that with that modification? And with Dr. Elder seconds. Okay, good. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Oh, oh wait, all those opposed, raise your hand. Okay. Um, so we have a uh, four, four, and one against. Um. Do you want to voice why you're against it, Janine? You don't have to. Um, I, I think 15 is not enough. I, I understand 30 is too much. I'd be more comfortable with 20, but 15 uh, doesn't sound like it's enough days. I don't see a good reason for just 15. Um, when other states allow for 20 and 30, to me, 20 felt a lot more comfortable. And so I would be um, happy with 20 but 15 doesn't seem like it's enough to, uh, to grant that. That's just personal preference. I would accept a friendly amendment. 20 is okay with me. 
I, I think we can haggle over the numbers, but I think philosophically, if we're looking at 20, that's 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 half a year. And if that's an every other week. It's less that, than half a year, but right, but it's, it's I'm right not concerned, but my concerns are not the same concerns. And that's and that's okay. You know, you, you have a concern of somebody coming into the state and practicing and not really, you know, getting a Texas license and being in here, our state for half a year. I, that's just not my concern. And so that's okay. We, we can have a difference on that. The main thing is that we're moving forward with this yes. and we like the idea of having it be across a year, not in a restricted 90 days. This is your start date. This is your stop date. Um, and so whether it's 15 or 20, we, it's okay if we don't have consensus. My feelings are not going to get hurt yeah. <laughs> just because I vote against it. My yeah. feelings are not hurt. Yeah. So um the motion passes at 15 and uh, so we'll just move forward from there. So, okay, um, let's see here. Um, where are we next? Uh, 12, no, 13B. Um, so this is about um, altering the terms of the LMFT associate such that the license is valid for five years. Um, it may not be renewed and does not require continuing education. Um, so, I guess does somebody want to talk about the the history of this um, the history of this and how we got here? Um, we talked about it in the rules committee. It was brought to us from, I believe, from Mr. Spinks. Um, just the purpose being to standardize across the different boards so that there's less staff time used to track the different licenses. We had a very robust discussion about it in the rules committee. Um, some of the against this were we want that there we want licensees to get in the habit of renewing their license every two years because that's what they have to do after their license so that they don't then go oh gosh it's been two years I have to renew already I thought it was five years um just because it's beneficial for licensees to get in that habit but that does use staff time so the cons were it just uses too much staff time and that supervisee, supervisors should be responsible for educating supervisees. A, once you're fully licensed, you need to start renewing every two years. Okay. Um, what happens, because I noticed that it's non-renewable. So remind me, what happens after the five years if you haven't met your hours? You have to like reapply, you have to retake the exam and everything? Everything. Okay, not the exam. Tim's saying no exam. Okay, Tim, tell us what they would have to do. Correct. You don't have to retake the exam. Okay. Uh, you would just reapply for a new five-year license. That's what happens with LPC, although it's pretty rare. Um, in running the numbers for MFT, 98% uh, of the associates get their uh, upgrade in, um, in under five years. I would think, is it probably about, do you know the average? Is it maybe three? That's it's, what I would think. It's under three years. It's in over the two, of course, but it's under three. In the last meeting, we asked that, and Ms. Basholt reported that the average time to get from associate to full LMFT was two and a half to three years. Okay, that's not bad. Uh, well, that's one renewal. That's one renewal cycle. Yes. I'm going to okay. plug in my laptop really quick. Um, Ms. Smith, though, you have the floor. You're muted. Uh, you an Thank you. You answered uh, part of the question because the way it was written, it didn't look like there was any remediation for them if they don't get it within five years. Because I've got a supervisee that I'm working with now that she spent the last three years with one supervisor who really didn't help track her hours. And all of a sudden she comes to me and I'm looking and she's been doing this for almost four years now. And her total, uh, direct hours are only 802 because of the pandemic. And so I, I was just looking, so just walk me through this, just because I'm stupid, walk me through this, that you have, you get your associate license, you're working on it, you're working on it, you're working on it. And 
once again, another crisis of the world hits that we aren't expecting and they can't get hours like they normally would. And five years starts to come up and tell me again what they do because it looks like you can't renew it. It's like, if you don't get it in five years, you're SOL. So where within there will it state what the remediation is? You would just you would just apply for a new one. There's no there's not a limit for the number of them that you get. So okay. you get a new five year, you get a new five year one, and then let's say okay. you only need a year of it. You upgrade after that year, and you move forward. Because all so, your hours will count from your previous license. Yeah. Okay. So somewhere in this, I, I feel like we need a little bit of clarity that says is valid for five years, may not be renewed, but can be reapplied or something to where, to where it gives them in one area of our rules, the next step. Well, I think it they says that in, in B. I think it says that in B because it says an LMFT associate who does not complete the required supervised experience hours during the 60 month time period must reapply for licensure. That's basically saying just ask for it again. Okay. But my concern is this. It, oh, I didn't mean to go ahead, Dr. Barti. I think you raised your well, hand. Well, I, I was just thinking that, you know, if an, under the system we have, they, they, they renew twice okay. and they have six years. If they don't have all their hours after six years, like, like uh, Ms. Smith's uh, example here, she would then reapply and, 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 and then she would be able to carry into that new reapplication all of her hours or would the would she have to start from scratch getting those hours under the system as it currently is or under the new system well under the under the current system because i think that's going to have an implication for what we're talking about here because i if if they're just re why why aren't they just renewing their license for another cycle what why would they need to reapply why, why don't if they're carrying after, it over right if they're carrying anyway. it over why don't they just re why don't they just renew it for another two-year cycle and then renew it for another two-year cycle if if they get to carry all the hours there's no there's no penalty or ding on that but, just, but that, I, I just think the way this is written is going to be confusing i was confused by looking at this well and see my confusion and like i is, said i'm stupid my, so maybe well, that, and that may be, but, <laughs> but after the end of six years, after the end of two renewals with all that, my understanding was you start over, you start over with, you, you got to get your 3000 hours. You, you have a new contract, you reapply, you have a new supervisor or the same, and you start over with those hours and stuff. Not under the way the oh. rule is currently, no, you don't have to, you would just, after the end of the six years. You would just have to reapply for your license. If I remember correctly, when I first came on the board, huh. and you're going to have to correct me about this, I think it actually said that you had to resubmit examination to examination. And there was debate over what that meant, because some thought that meant that if you didn't have it within six years, you had to retake the licensure exam. And so we clarified that to get rid of, to make it, because we didn't want people to have to retake the licensure exam after six years. So I think we changed the language, but I can't remember for sure. Tim, you're well, kind of on your head. I like the idea of clarifying, you know, exactly what this is, because it leaves it to all, look, look at the interpretations we have. And, and we've been doing this for a while. And well, that's and, why this would clear that up, because all that old language would go away and it would just say you have five years to get your license at the end of the five years. If you don't, if you haven't gotten it yet, you just apply for your license over again. OK, now, and, and would that be a total new license number? No, same license number. You don't have so to they're in essence again. extending their license. Kind of, but they probably have to resubmit a new application, pay a new application fee. But that's a renewal with a fee. That's not a reapplication. I think the practical me, help me understand. The practical effect, Dr. Barty, is it works the same as a renewal. But the administ within the administrative database system, it's a very different animal. Uh, it's it's that license ends. You you now have to apply for a new license. Yeah. That'd be the same license number, but it, they're they're different. Uh, it, it's just a different animal, and it, it's different workloads. Renewals, um, 
that's the best way I can explain it, you know, without just geeking out on the database on you. Um, the, you're right. The practical effect, as you look at it, is the same. Back here on our end, it's a different animal. We see it differently here on the back end. So, well, uh, and, and I'm wondering if and, the word reapply as opposed to renew. Well, because, okay. Yeah. Because you you guys on your end you can do whatever you want to whatever the word is but for for what's written here it says must must renew their license no it says reapply right that's what i'm saying is if we if we if the wording were changed to renew that's that's a different construct in the minds of people like me because i think i'm getting dr smith's stupid it's it's drifting through the screen over here to me. I know. Let's hear, because I think that probably Mr. Spear and Mr. Hyde can probably give us some reason on why we're doing renew versus, or why we're doing reapply versus renew. So Excellent. which one of you wants to go first? Mr. Spear, Mr. Hyde, you wanna duke it out? Which one wants to go first? Okay, or you wanna hear from Dr. Elder first? Okay, Dr. Elder. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, <clears throat> I was just bringing up a different issue, I think, which is that, um, if we're allowing them to say, okay, five years, if you don't get it, just submit a new application, don't retake the exam, then are we, does that lead to the possibility of a, you're always an LMFT associate, you don't ever have to finish those hours. We're just letting them renew year after year and they don't have to ever upgrade. That's my concern. I would wanna say you can renew it or reapply for one more five-year period, but after that, you need to shit or get off the pot. <laughs> I love it, Dr. Elder. Um, I think um, I think the reason why I don't think we'd run into that is nobody wants to be an LMFT associate forever. You're under That's supervision right. and you are, you can't bill insurance. You know what I mean? So it's like, nobody wants to be an associate. Okay, Mr. Hyde and then Mr. Spear. Yeah, to, to answer that question, um, under the current system, they could potentially be hypothetically an, uh, an associate indefinitely. So this doesn't change that, but the likelihood of that is extremely low. Like like everyone said, that nobody wants to be an associate for forever. the The structure of this rule is modeled after how the uh, LPC associates work, and so and that's been that works for a, a huge number of people, and there really isn't much of an issue with it. So the reason why it's structured that way, where it expires after sixty months, is it's exactly how the LPCs work. If it was a renewal, if we said renewal, then that's where you would have to require continuing education and all these other things, which the whole point is they're under supervision. They're supposed to be getting education during that time as well as practicing. So it's getting the supervision education and then getting CE education. And it just seems like that that's not something that LPC associates have ever needed or required. And there's thousands of them and it seems to be working fine. So it's that was why we're modeling it after that. Uh, the other thing is going going to uh, one of the other points about why is this a uh, the same license number and not since it's a, a, a reapplication, not a different license number. We do that specifically so we can track if it's license number one, two, three, four, and then they let that expire and then they reapply for you know uh, five, six, seven, eight license number. If the public looks up that license number, it's only going to be that one that that old license that they got in trouble. Now they got this new license that looks all all nice and and you know none of the history attached to it. So we make sure they keep that number so that all of the things that happened in the past track with them. So, thank you, Mr. Mr. Hyde, Mr. Spear. Thank you, Chair. One one last point let's keep in mind that we don't want to regulate to the outlier. Only 2%, at, actually a little under 2%, go beyond five years. So yeah. we're talking, we're spending a lot of time here talking about the, the very rare instance that somebody's going to go that long. And if somebody's going to go that long, I mean, they're going to find out what it is they need to do. Well, and I'm hoping that when we get further in our agenda, there's some other things that might help address some of that 2%. So um, anyways, so- could I, could I ask one more clarifying question? Because I, I heard that this also eliminates CEs because I didn't see that in the language. So because it's not mentioned in the language, that means that the CEs for LMFT associates is going away. 
with the five with the five year approach. Because I think okay. as, yeah, as Mr. Spear pointed out, or maybe okay. Hyde, that basically they're under supervision, and so they should be getting kind of they should can be can continuing to get education. So even if they're not getting like CEUs in a formal setting, they're getting CEUs in their supervision. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. And, and that's similar to the LPC, which, you know, and, and LPC associates get CEs. Uh, they just don't count them toward their license. Right. So, yeah. Okay. Any other discussion or questions? Do I have a motion then? Dr. Barty? I'll, I'll make a motion. We accept it as written. Is there a, Mr. Parrish seconds? Or do you have a question? Are you no, seconding? Second. Second. Okay. Um, so then all those in favor of accepting this rule, raise your hand. Okay. All those opposed, raise your hand. All those abstaining, raise your hand. Okay. Um, so we have uh, four uh, for the language and one abstaining. So the motion passes. Okay, um, let's move on to the next agenda item. Um, this is number 14. Um, so agenda item A um, is to allow doctoral program students to count supervised experience. Well, I'm sorry, let me just ask this first. Do we need a break? Does anybody need a, a potty break or anything? I'm good to keep going. Okay. Um, Okie dokie, so uh, number uh, 14A, to allow doctoral program students to count supervised experience hours towards licensure requirements when attained, ab obtained after the conferral of their master's degree that meets the licensure requirements. Um, essentially, this comes out of, um, sometimes we have a hard time with our PhD students. Um, they graduate with their uh, PhD, they go work for a university, and um, sometimes that's when they then apply for their LMFT associate. Um, and getting all those hours while you are working full-time for a university um, is almost impossible. And so we've run into this issue, I think a few times where we've had, um, just it's really difficult sometimes for those PhD students to be able to get hours, to accrue the, the hours that they need to become fully licensed. And so anyways, that's kind of the history of this. Um, I don't know if I need to say more or not, but um, Dr. Elder. I just need help understanding how is this different than what is already happening? In my mind, if you have your master's degree and you apply for a license, your hours as an associate count, whether you're in a doc program or not. So I guess I just need clarification. Um, one, not everybody applies for their LMFT associates right after they get their master's degree. So some people will apply while they're halfway through their PhD program or at the end of their PhD program. So this would allow those hours that they got in their practicum while still in their PhD program, but not an associate, it would allow those hours to count. Also, I don't know how staff is doing it now, but I can remember when I was first on the board, there was some, we had a case one time that, I don't know, somebody was basically saying that there was still, because of the other statute, there was a limit on how many of the hours they could actually take from their doctoral program and apply. And so there was just it was a big issue, but that was like years ago. And I don't know how staff is handling those situations now. But anyways, this would just basically allow people who don't get their associates right immediately to be able to count all those hours. Does that make almost, sense? Almost retroactively. Like you waited till you got the PhD and started working full time to go for the LMFT associate. Now that you have it, you can go back and count all those practicum and internship hours you got during your PhD before you were licensed. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. Ms. Smith, Dr. Barty, Mr. Parrish, Ms. Husband Thompson. I like it. Any other discussion? Okay. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion. Okay. Do I have a second? Okay. Ms. Husband Thompson seconds. Okay, um, any other further, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Okay, um, agenda item number 14B, um, to expand the list of providers from which licensees must obtain their 50% continuing uh, education to include a hospital or hospital system. Um, any discussion on this? 
Okay. Can I have a, does anybody want to make a motion to accept this? Ma Ms. Madam Smith? Chair. Oh, yes. Madam Chair, you might want to visit, check on Mr. Hyde real quick. Oh, I'm so sorry. I keep missing you over there. I apologize. Mr. Hyde. I'm hiding in the corner. The, the one thing I was going to say is Sarah has a nice note in there for A2. Since it was contingent on the previous rule discussion, uh, staff would then propose uh, not only the additions that are in here, but also A2 be struck as uh, she's indicated in her little comment. Um, it's just not lined through in there. A2 is where the LMFT associate would have, it's talking about the renewal of the license. And since we're going to be proposing that they're not renewing it anymore, it's something that they can't comply with. So I think it needs to be struck, but it's it's not lined through. So I wanted to make sure you you saw that and it might need to be included in a motion if you're interested. So wait, I'm sorry. Are we talking about 14A or 13A? Oh, we're in uh, 14B, aren't we? 14B. Yeah, we're in 14B. But he's oh. talking about 801.261A2 oh. within 14B. There's a section that talks about the MF, the LMFT associate CE requires requirements. And oh, that's okay. gone because we just passed a rule saying five years, no CEs. Okay. Um, so we're going to strike two. Correct. A2. Mm -hmm. Yep. Correct. And I have a question about oh. adding the hospital <laughs> system. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just curious about where this originated from. Did we have people reach out and say, hey, you forgot hospitals? Or, I mean, just where did this originate from? It, it came out of the big kerfuffle over at the LPC board when this rule came up with them. Okay. And there was a big, you know, there was a lot of consternation about the list of providers. And so Patrick and I were talking about, okay, what can we do to make sure that we have maximized the number of reliable mm -hmm. providers under that list? Hospitals and large clinics came up. And then we also learned, uh, and this is totally my fault. I, this, I'm going to eat this one. But when we when these rules came out, we did not put a future effective date on that 50% list. Mo the rest of the rule is stuff that everybody could comply with easily and, and not get hung up on. But I screwed up and I did not realize that you got some folks that they may not be able to hit that 50% mark this first renewal cycle to give enough time. So that's why we're telling you in that very last paragraph down there, that section won't be effective until February 2024 or something. I know that seems like a long ways out, but remember, we operate off two-year renewal cycles, so that's why we're doing that. But that that screw-up is all on me there, okay. and I'm just trying to correct it. Yeah, sure. Well, I just have to say, in the recent training I did, I had over 50 supervisors in the room, mostly LPC supervisors, and the question about CE providers came up, and some people said, I don't know anybody who's on this list who I get CEs from, but that was one person. 99% of the people in the room said, I don't know anybody that I get CEs from who's not on this list. Yeah. And I mean, so I, I got no pushback whatsoever from it. And I think, I think it's a good rule. Yeah. And I like the addition of the hospital because I think that does address a squeaky wheel. Mm -hmm. And plus, plus I'm, I'm, I'm personally aware of hospitals that offer CEs for mental health providers that mm -hmm. are doing that uh, that that offer that and and so I'd, uh, I'd I'd like to make a motion that we um, that we accept this with the striking of um, of item two the hours and okay. and then accept it uh, because it looks like that's not stricken that's just highlighted that but that we strike uh, a two on that and accept it Okay, so uh, that was Dr. Barty making the motion. Dr. Elder seconded. Uh, Mr. Spear, you had your hand raised. Is there something you wanted to say? Uh, no, I lowered it. Okay. Um, um, all those then in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Um, okay, let's move on to 15A. Um, the, this is um, discussion and possible action concerning public comment that we have received. So the first one is uh, regarding the definition of direct clinical services. Um, basically here, um, again, just as a part of a rulemaking process, we have already voted these in, um, BHEC approved it, it went to public comment, now it's come back to us and we have the option to be able to make changes um, or to accept the rule as is, um, and then forward it to BHEC to finish out the rulemaking. Um, so is there any discussion about um, A, uh, Dr. Elder? 
so the public comment that we received, the first one from Priscilla Kalantari, I think what she was saying is that she wants those group counseling hours in that residential setting to count as relational hours. And they do based on our definition, the way that she's describing it. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I, I don't see a problem with her public comment. I think we're already amenable to what she's suggesting. The second one from Dr. Morris really gave, made me think, made me pause and think that I definitely would not be okay with an LMFT associate getting all of their experience in like a residential setting without sitting down with a couple, without sitting down with a family unit for any of those relational hours. So I, I do think he, he makes a good point and I would be up for discussing the limit of the 10% of those alternative hours that he proposed. Uh, Mr. Spear? Would you like me to pull up the language on share screen? Uh, would y'all? Yes. Uh, Ms. Smith said yes. Yes, please. Okay. Now let's see if I can find it. Are we on 15A? Uh, yes, sir. I believe. Make sure. Yes, 15A. Can you make that a little bit bigger? Yes. Let's say I can. Cool. Thank you. Okay, um, so any other comments regarding kind of what Dr. Elder has brought up, um, what uh, Dr. Morris has brought up about the, um, just about the concern that somebody could get all their hours, like say at a residential treatment center and not have ever worked with um, a couple or a family. I guess I'll say that I share that same concern um, to to an extent, uh, Mr. Spear. It's not letting me lower my hand at the moment. I'm not asking. You. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, um, I, oh, yeah. um, Let's do Miss Smith and then Dr. Barty. Okay. Would you mind to go ahead and read? just for the public who's listening, yeah. would you mind to go ahead, Dr. Elder, and read uh, James's concern? Because it was, it was really, it made a lot of sense as well with him really highlighting the friendship community support system aspect. Would you mind to read that out loud? His, do sure. you have that where you could do I that? I do, I do, and I'm happy to do it. That's a great idea. So the public is part of the conversation. Thank so his you. comment was, while the proposed definition in part mirrors the definition included in the COMFT standards, the proposed definition should not be accepted as written. Given that the current MFT rules require only 75 hours of direct client contact with couples and families during the graduate practicum and require at least 500 hours of direct client contact with couples and families during the postgraduate during the LMFT associate period. And given that the proposed definition of direct clinical services to couples or families includes, quote, enduring friendships, community support systems, and residential treatment or ritually connected systems, close quote. And given that the proposed definition does not delineate percentages of types or categories of couple and family hours that must be accrued in the graduate practicum and postgraduate LMFT associate period, it is possible, should this definition be approved, that a person may become an LMFT in Texas without having worked clinically with few or any intact families and or couples. It is recommended, therefore, that the board place a limit on these, quote, alternative hours, that is the enduring friendships, community support systems, residential treatment, or ritually connected systems, of no more than 10% of the total required relational hours for both the graduate practicum and the postgraduate LMFT associate phase. Thank you, I appreciate you reading that out loud because I think that it's important in our line or, or the way I look at our practice as so drastically different than any other practice that's licensed is that we, yes, we do have the ability to work within a residential setting. We do have that ability. To, that would be the systemic piece of it. But it is so important that 
we deal with families to where even if you get out of your residential family system, uh, you're, you're still within your, your own family system. Uh, there's no time limit on that. Even if you decide for a cutoff, you still have blood ties, which makes it unique and it makes it a different. So I, I share his concern on this and I would be uh, very supportive of us either redoing it or tabling this and send it back to rules for another look um, than just voting on it. But of course, I have been the voice of dissension in voting today. <laughs> so, but that's my two cents. Well, I'm with you, Janine, uh, but let me hear from Dr. Barty first. Yeah, so 10% of, of that, that's 50 hours, right? That. Is that what he's suggesting that no more than 50 hours? Well, I think he was saying the 75 pre-graduate plus the 500 postgraduate is 575. So 10% of that would be 57.5 if you want to get technical with the numbers. Okay. So if someone is working at a hospital as a medical family therapist. That would still be re relational because more than likely you'd be working with parent and child. See, y'all are using the word concern. I'm intrigued. Uh, I, I don't see it as a concern. I'm curious about that uh, as to how that would uh, how that would play out because there are going to be some LMFTs that will be hired to do as an LMFT, for example, in in a in, in a um, uh, medical surgical uh, hospital and. Um, they, they work with families of, of patients of kids or whatever that's in there. And I'm just wondering how, how that would, how that would play out. And I know that's a, that's a small, very small percentage. I will say that I have actually seen it work out. I mean, like I have, like, I know licensees who got their hours in a psychiatric hospital doing running groups and mm -hmm. counting those groups as relational hours. And that's the only relational experience they've ever had. Um, I will say the people that I know have done that have gone on to not work with couples and families. They have gone on to do basically stay within, you know, a psychiatric hospital or a mm -hmm. prison or, you know what I mean? They've gone on to continue to do that work and they have not gone on to work with couples and families. And I think I can't help though. Part of that is because they probably didn't feel confident to work with couples and families because they never had, you know, um, so anyways, and I also, as I think about um, the proliferation of online programs and in most online programs, you have to find your own, um, your own internship site. And oftentimes those internship sites are things like psychiatric hospitals or other where they are maybe perhaps running groups. I do think it's actually theoretically possible that somebody could with this rule be able to get their you know, be able to get all their hours running groups and never yeah. actually see a couple or a family. Yeah, but, at, and and why I'm curious about this is because at where, wherever they are, they're systemic. Right. And, and I don't want to limit systemic therapy to just being couple mm -hmm. therapy. I, I think that sure. is a, that's a subset of all of that. Mm -hmm. um, in, in my supervision, I've had LMFT associates who work at hospitals, who work at residential treatments and things that also have a private practice in the evening or on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And that's where they get their couple hours. And so they're able to get that because right. that's what they want. But I don't, I don't, I, I think as long as, as, as long as the, the systemic emphasis is, is coming from the therapist and that's, that's what's being provided. Uh, maybe by by the supervisor or as as they're getting all that that I I I I don't have a concern about putting a cap or putting restrictions. I I I like this the way it's written, and I think it's doable in practice. So, so you'd, I'm you'd be in favor of not doing a cap. Correct. Okay. Correct. Other conversation, other discussion? I did have one other question. If we do decide to do a cap, 
that's another thing that staff then has to track on, on that if we decide to do that. And so, you know, there's the, there, there's the downside to that because, whew, you know, they already have to make sure that they're tracking that we're the only group out of all the mental health licenses that has this 500 systemic portion to it. So they already have to, they already have to count that. And then are we going to divide it that? So if, that's, a, if, that's a concern too. If we put a cap on it, wouldn't that be the responsibility of the supervisor? Yeah, but you'd still, your to staff oversee still, that? yeah, but your staff still at the end of the day, just because you have signed off on it, staff is still right. looking at the hours and where they came from. Right. But I think I, so they would, they would be, that'd be one more layer of something that we're asking them to do potentially. Would that be correct? Granted, but I'm thinking that the onus is on the supervisor to ensure that the hours are logged in certain categories that that the supervisor no i uh, agree right i agree so, you still are asking you still have to have staff mm -hmm. oh, look over it right this would be another line item mm -hmm. that would be in the form for upgrade mm -hmm. let's hear from doctor or not from dr spinks from uh, mr spinks and then mr spear uh, janine hit on part of what I was going to talk or that's a big concern of mine is we're adding yet another check another thing that we've got to look at and I, I mean I got to tell y'all y'all's licensing scheme is the most convoluted and difficult to calculate hands down um, I worry about that from our perspective but honestly because of the the complexity of it I worry about it from the the license or the applicants and the licensee standpoint as well now you've effectively got a licensing standard buried in the definition section. This is a problem that really all the boards except for site has in that we've got licensing standards sprinkled all throughout the practice standards uh, of the rules. And it makes it very difficult for applicants and licensees to figure out what is it we actually have to comport with. Yeah. We dealt with this problem at site years ago when we did a massive overhaul and we, we pulled out all licensing standards and separated them in separate licensing rules. And then we created practice standards uh, that this, this once you're licensed, this is what you follow. And we, we made a clear distinction, but the MFT, LPC and social work and social work in particular is bad. They're not broken down that way. It's like an Easter egg hunt when you're trying to find this stuff. And so I, I really do worry about that, that aspect of it. Like if we added a cap, you're worried that if we added a cap, it would just, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, nobody's going to intuitively look in the definitions to no. see that cap. Yeah. And so it's not an intuitive place for it. And that's what we did at Psych is we figured, we tried to think, okay, what's the intuitive place you're going to look for like, a licensing yeah. standard? Yeah, I do think that if we were to, we would, I think that the way that it would work if we did decide to do the cap is we'd have this definition and then over in the, where we talk about hours is where we put the cap about the 10%. But but well, anyways, I don't, but if we even decide to go that way, let me hear from Mr. Spear and then Dr. Elder, did you have something you wanted to add? I couldn't tell. I'm okay. Good. Okay. Mr. Spear. Thank you, Chair. The, the one thing I would like to add is I want to make sure that we have our minimum standards at on. Do we think that if somebody got all of their experience running groups would be an unsafe practitioner? Because if you don't think he's going to be an unsafe practitioner, then, you know, it might not, this person might not be the best trained to perform couples therapy, but is the person going to be unsafe? Mm. Because that's what the mandate is, is to make sure that we have safe practitioners. So if the, if this rule, you know, if this definition you think would point to an unsafe practitioner, then you don't want it. If you think it, if you don't think it's going to point to an unsafe practitioner. That's a good question, Mr. Spear. Uh, Dr. Elder. Um, so I, I share Dr. Morris's concern. I would not be in favor of somebody coming out and getting all of their hours in some residential setting where they haven't ever worked with a couple or a family. At the same time, I am going to assume that if someone is putting in the time and the energy and the money to pursue an LMFT license, 
and they want to work with couples and families, they're going to seek that out as part of their supervision experience and that associate phase. And so I really, I understand the concern, but I think we are, are as in, in Mr. Spears' words, we're regulating the outlier if we were to add this. And I think the increase in staff time that it would require to track this is not worth it. And the other piece is we already have so many barriers to this license that I do not wanna add another barrier, another thing for licensees to track, which translates in my mind into another reason not to pursue this license. So I'm in favor, despite the concern of keeping it the way it is. Okay. Same. Yeah. Yep. I think so. Okay, so any further discussion about this? I can't see everybody's faces, so we just- Tim you, can, <clears throat> Tim, you can take down the big screen, the share screen. Thank you. Okay, then is there a motion on the floor? Uh, Ms. Smith? Make a motion to adopt this. Okay, uh, Dr. Barty seconds. Um, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that is unanimous. Okay, we are just plugging right along. I love this. Okay, um, 15B. Um, to clarify how supervisees uh, represent themselves to the clients and the public. I don't think we got any, there was no public comment on this. Um, any discussion? Is it there was a just a matter of time before this landed on our doorstep. Um, yeah. yeah, I make a motion to accept as, a, as written. A second. Okay, Ms. Smith seconds. All the, any further discussion? All those in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous, so that passes. Um, okay, and then we have the severity level and sanction guide. Um, and is it possible for us to look at C and D together since they're connected? Oh, uh, Mr. Hyde. Yeah, I, sorry, Chair Merchant. I just wanted to jump in uh, and say there's a second version of uh, 15C, which is uh, 80132. Uh, and that's there. Basically, this was to try to streamline the rule. And upon looking at somebody brought up a good point where one of the things we were doing is, is putting the dollar amounts in, in 801.302 in, in one and two, but there are no dollar amounts mentioned in three and four. And then in subsection five, it does talk about the penalty amounts. And so, so part of the discussion was, well, why didn't you add it to three and four to make it mirror what's in one and two? And then we thought, well, why don't we just put everything in five and then it covers everything and it just makes it uh, a little bit more simple, a little bit more streamlined. So um, the one that's proposed is fine, but this, I, we just, I wanted to highlight, and I don't know if you want me to do a share screen so you can see what it, what I'm talking about, but it should be in your, your materials. But I just wanted to bring that up so you know why there's two versions and, and why staff is basically recommending a little bit more streamlined approach with the second one that has the highlights, I guess. Okay. Dr. Elder? Um, I believe that we talked about the combination of level two and three into one level previously in rules committee, and there was no opposition to it. It just makes more sense to for the sanction guide to be more clear. And I'm absolutely in favor of version two that puts the administrative penalty down in um, number five, all in one place, because I did go read the statute and that is directly reflective of the statute. So I think it just makes sense to go with version two. Okay, do you wanna make a motion? I make a motion that we go with version two. Uh, Dr. Barty seconds, all those in favor, raise your hand. Okay, that would be unanimous so that we move on. Okay, um, Agenda item number 16, discussion regarding whether an individual who is duly licensed as an LPC associate and an LMFT associate, and who is under the supervision of a duly licensed supervisor, um, that they may count that supervision hour towards both the LMFT and the LPC. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Hyde, or Mr. Hyde, did you have something you wanted to add? I just wanted a point of clarification. Was that motion also for 15D as well as 15C? Yes, I think, I believe. Okay, I just want to make sure we were approving that one as well. So, sorry. No, you're good. Um, so essentially, this again came out of um, um, Daryl and I sitting in the airport waiting on airplanes that never came in Daryl's case. No, um, it came for you and you left me. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Anyways, we don't have to talk about my abandonment of you. Anyways. Um, so let's see here. So one of the things that uh, I don't even know how this came up in our conversation, but Daryl mentioned that um, if an LPC and an LMFT associate are both being licensed or both being supervised by a duly licensed individual, that staff requests that they on their, I guess, when they turn in their supervision, that they determine whether this was a, an LPC hour, or an LMFT hour. And I was like, why are we doing that? Like, it just needs to one hour can count towards both licenses. And so he just wanted clarification to make sure that the board really truly believes that they should be able to count it that way. So. Yeah, my fear is, yeah. is there's always been this discussion and everybody's always been quick to point out the distinctions between the professions. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't want to do is have staff start accepting hours that someone had claimed under their LPC licensure application towards their MFT license. And then y'all go, Hey, that was not a hey buddy. That was not marriage and family therapy. That was counseling. That's what they said. And then the individual would do vice versa over here. And then I'd be in trouble with the LPC board on that. So I'm taking this to both boards. And what I want is I, I want y'all to vote and tell me, yes, you're good to go on that. You can do that because I just don't, y'all may be cool with it. And then 10 years down the road, the next board may be, I don't know why y'all, you know, I don't want to get fussed at 10 years down the road by the next board that comes along, doesn't agree with it. So uh, give me some cover here. Okay, Miss Smith. Oh, I'm sorry, you unmuted, so I assumed you had a, something you wanted to say. Um, Dr. Elder? No, or Dr. no I was just going to say, don't get anybody. You're not going to be around here 10 years from now. <laughs> <laughs> don't get us. <laughs> is, it, is that a voluntary departure or an involuntary departure that I need to be worried about? <laughs> just you're going to need your head examined to do 10 more years of this, I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. No. Dr. Bertie? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I make sure that my, because uh, I'm, I'm dual licensed and dual, and I I do have a handful that are dual track with that. And I just make sure in their logs that they have relational hour columns and, and other direct hours, that they keep those separate. So at the very end, I know exactly how many relational hours they are logging for the LP, LMFT license and how many they are they are accumulating combined because LPC can count relational and individual but i have it broken down in my log with that way and i think i think most supervisors are thinking that way and so i i don't i i don't think that's it's it's an issue well would somebody like to make a motion to direct staff to wait, count wait i just i just want to make sure that i'm understanding so if a a person is both an LPC associate and an LMFT associate, and they are under the supervision of one supervisor who is both an LPCS and an LMFTS. Their hours count toward both licensures at the same time. Yes. I've yeah. always told people double dip, go get yeah. a supervisor who's licensed as super. I mean, come on, that's just the easiest way to do it. So yes. Yeah. All right, go ahead. I'm um, so I'll, I'll make a motion. I okay. so motion to accept okay. the rule as written. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Barty seconds. You bet. Um, all those in favor of directing staff to count hours this way. Yes, that is all of us. Okay, so unanimous again. Okay, um, let's move on to- yeah, I just hope the LPC board views it the same way. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a two-way street. Exactly, yeah. Okay, number 17, discussion and possible action regarding the jurisprudence exam. Um, one thing that I will say about the jurisprudence exam, um, there are probably a lot of concerns. I, don't, I think Dr. Elder brought up in the last meeting that she had retaken it and it had been like a ton of BHEC questions. Well, apparently what had happened is um, it had been taken off of non-randomized um, so that whenever examinees were taking it, they were just taking the questions all in order. And so the first 40 questions deal with BHEC. And so... Um, yeah, so I apologize to anybody who has taken the jurisprudence exam in the last three months. You are well versed in BHEC at this point in time. Um, anyways, so Sarah reached out to the vendor and they have put us back on to back to the randomized so that people will getting be getting a random sample of questions rather than just those first 40 about BHEC. So, Yay. Yes. Um, any other discussion about the jurisprudence exam? Okay. Um, then let's move on to, oh, to me, to report from the board chair. Um, okay, so I just want to tell y'all that I went to, um, there are a couple of things I want to cover. 
Um, I went to the BHEC, not to the BHEC meeting, to the AMFTRB meeting. Um, it was uh, it was very good. Um, they had a lot of good, robust discussions about things. One of the very first things that we discussed was um, was license portability. And so essentially, um, as a kind of a recap, the, there are four basic ways that they talked about. Um, hang on a sec, I'm trying to pull up my notes. There are four different ways they they we talked about uh, portability, like four different pathways. The first one is, of course, by compacts. Um, as we have talked about numerous times, cap compacts can be very expensive. They require legislative action. Um, they are usually run by third parties. Um, one of the things couple of the things that make a con an MFT compact um, less likely um, to happen in our profession is that there's not really a third party who is willing to take it up. Um, I attended a, the AAMFT a board meeting, uh, not board meeting, a business meeting a couple of weeks ago. Did anybody else attend that? Okay. They, they, there, they talked about um, basically that they're unwilling to probably move into a compact essentially because it's very expensive. Um, the other problem is that the states that are probably, we'd probably have to have on board would probably be California and New York and maybe even Florida. And those states are not interested in doing a compact, but those are like the, the big heavy hitters, like the, the states with the most MFTs and the states that most people want to be duly licensed in. And so consequently, it just, there's just not a lot of traction for it. Okay. Um, so anyway, so kind of, that was kind of the conversation about compacts. Um, Daryl, you're also welcome to jump in here if you have additional thoughts or ideas about any of this. Um, the next thing they talked about was reciprocity, which is basically where two states get together and say, hey, we want to have reciprocity. This works really well in regions. So for example, if as Texas, if we wanted to develop reciprocity with like New Mexico, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Arkansas, um, so that that would maybe enable like, you know, people who live kind of on the border to be able to, you know, um, you know, to be duly licensed or, you know, um, I don't know, but it would basically, these tend to be more regional where you look at the states kind of around you and you kind of develop uh, reciprocity. Um, I do think that would be an interesting option for us in Texas. I am very curious um, how many of our licensees would be interested in us developing reciprocity with New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, you're shaking your heads, Tim, you're saying none, you don't think they'd be, you don't think so? Oh, maybe you don't. It's not about have... interest, it's about authority. There, say that again. It's not about interest, it's about authority. Only the psych board has authority to, to enter into a re reciprocal agreement with another state. Really? So, you can like it as much as yeah. you can, you just don't have the authority to do it. Oh. You mean statutory authority? Correct. Well, never mind. I guess that's not an option either. Bummer. I thought maybe that would be the route we could go. Um, but it can be a legislative fix. Okay. All you need to do is copy the the site board legis uh, statute. Uh, I'm actually working. Patrick and I are working with Oklahoma right now. They're trying to get reciprocity because we've got a, a deal fairly well hammered out with Oklahoma. So and which board? Site site board. Okay. But Oklahoma doesn't have the statutory authority, but their board has the ability to go lobby the legislature. Mm. And so they've teamed up with their psych association and they are going to go visit, see if they can get a, a bill sponsor to, to get that done. So they're they're cautiously optimistic. So but the great uh, but, thing is that our association, why it's so important for our licensees to be a member of our state association, our state association does have the ability to lobby. So that is a great route for them to go. Right. Well, I noticed that they, I was, anyways, I don't know if anybody else has read their legislative update they published, but in their legislative update uh, or their legislative agenda, I should call it, um, they noted in there that they were going to probably push for a compact, that that was probably the way that they wanted to go was towards compacts uh, as opposed to reciprocity. So I'll tell you, DOD is pushing hard on compacts right now. They they have kind of thrown the gauntlet down on this because their their folks are getting hung up by the various licensing standards across the country. So DOD is willing to throw down some money to to push this thing through. the The problem with compacts is you've got to have a host mm -hmm. to to manage that thing, and AMFTRB doesn't sound like they're interested in doing it. And outside of that, I'm not sure 
I, I don't know who you have. I don't I don't know who would set the machinery up. Council of state governments can help you draft it, build it, and kind of get it initially set up, but they can't they can't help you in the initial launch of it. Mm -hmm. There's got to be a host to take over those functions. And that's where, apart from California not being interested in doing it because California wants to do their own thing, um, you got a, you got a hosting problem here too. Well, that was, that's why, I mean, so WMFT seems like the other option for the host, but again, at the meeting, I mean, they were kind of, I don't know, they were like, they didn't seem like that's what they wanted to do, but they also kept being like, we're about to spend a bunch of money on something, but we can't really tell you what. And so I don't know, but anyways, it's, it's, I don't think that WMFT would be it. It's dangerous okay. having the, an association host a quasi quasi governmental entity, like a compact or it's not even quasi, it is governmental because then you've got the state or a national association. That's who you're talking about, right? The national mm -hmm. association. Yeah, you don't really want the trade association being in charge and running the governmental, the governmental entity. It gets into this whole anti-competitive, antitrust areas. There's there's too much room for influence there, um, and so that that's that's real dangerous. I, I I don't imagine that would not be a good marriage. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't think. I'm I'm confused. Wondering <clears throat> who would be a good host. Because we can't, the, we can't as a board host it. And right. then if a state, if a, like a, a national professional association can't host it, who is an appropriate host? I don't know. I, I, cause I don't know. I mean, psych board did it. Uh, psych boards is through ASPPB. Um, social works will more than likely be through ASWB. And these are all the associations of the state regulatory boards. So mm -hmm. you don't have that conflict problem there. AM, AMFTRB would, would have been the natural choice to do this, but I don't think they're interested in doing it. Um, so I'm not sure. I, I don't know who you would do. Who you would look to. I'm still not giving up on the idea of reciprocity. And I, I also read TMFT's statement. And um, I don't think that the lobbyist actually wrote that for TMFT. So I, I'm still not giving up on reciprocity with our lobbyist team. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, the third avenue is endorsement. Um, this is a one-way street, you know, where basically we would endorse people coming into Texas. Um, we already have this somewhat. Um, we have basically two years right now where if somebody has been licensed in good standing in another jurisdiction for two years, we consider their academic and their experience requirements to have been met. Um, we could, as a board, consider reducing this to a year, you know, um, if we think that would be helpful. Um, so I don't know, that might be another option would be would be that, but I'm getting some head shakes. So maybe that's not an option. Um, did you want to well, say something? I, I, think, I think exactly what you said, that is a one-way street. Right. It doesn't help our practitioners when we're out of town. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, <laughs> Everyone knows I'm a big mercenary, so I want us to benefit for whatever right. we're doing. Yeah. More than I, I care if other people benefit off of us. Yeah. Said it out loud. Yeah. Well, the, the whole, the one of the reasons is we just think about trying to get clinicians to be able to come here and provide services to the public. You know, that would be the reason to, to go for endorsement, even though we don't get anything out of it. But I like the, I, I like the ones where it's two ways also that that would be my preference. Okay, and then the last way would be moving towards universal licensure, um, which is basically where we'd have a federal license. So, you know, pilots, nurse practitioners, um, you know, a, a commercial driver's license, you know, all those things, nursing home administrators, those are like national licenses as opposed to state. But I don't know that that's, there, I don't think there's any traction for that either. Um, so in other words, it sounds like here in Texas, unless we can get the ability to create reciprocity, um, it sounds like I just feel like in so many ways, our hands are tied and it's frustrating to me, um, to be quite honest. So I totally agree. it's so frustrating and it doesn't seem like our national uh, organization is as helpful in growing our profession as I wish that they would be, because that's why we all got this second license is because we believe in it and we believe in the models behind it. So I agree. Super frustrating. 
but don't give up. All of you that are out there still working on your LMFT, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Mr. Spinks? There may, there may be one other um, option or avenue that might develop on the legislative front. And you had mentioned universal licensure. That, that, that's also a term that's used to describe like uh, the Arizona and Florida method for getting in. It's, it's again, though, it's like Janine said, it's a one-way street. It doesn't help us on the outbound. Yeah. Um, Arizona and Florida take a different approach to it. Uh, Florida is probably the more efficient way to handle it. And what I'm talking about is when I say universal licensure, it's basically a, one state recognizing, hey, you're already licensed in good standing in another state. Therefore, that will you just come in and you're basically entitled to a license here. Or you can simply register. In Florida, that's how it works. I think you just register down there and you, you don't even have to actually get a license. You're good to go. Um, I, I, there's probably some limitations on what you can do and can't do. But for the most part, it, it's designed to streamline you in. But it doesn't help our folks going out. And the only way to do that is if you get the ability to enter into reciprocal agreements. Now, I'll tell you one of the things you're going to run into, even if you get the authority, and we've hit it in psych, is not, you know, the other 49 jurisdictions don't have reciprocity authority. Uh, that's what you're going to run into. You're going to get it. You're going to be like, all right, this is cool. Let's use it. And you're going to find New, Me New Mexico doesn't have it. Oklahoma doesn't have it. You know, Louisiana and Arkansas. All the reason I know that is because I've already hit them up. Yeah. And Louisiana had it for psych. But what they wanted to do wasn't reciprocity. They wanted our folks to jump through a whole bunch more hoops than what our folks would, uh, than what, you know, we were making their folks jump through. So we kind of said, no, thank you. Um, anyway, that that's just what you're going to run into even once you get it. Yeah. But it's it's still better to have it. And, uh, I'd rather have it and not need it or not be able to use it right now because at least it, it can just lie dormant until somebody else finally wises up and, mm -hmm. you know, gets it. Okay. Thank you, Daryl. Um, okay. Other things that they talked about um, at uh, AMFTRB, um, they kind of reviewed the WMFT workforce survey. Um, also, if you want more information about that, they're actually doing, WMFT is doing a webinar over it um, this coming Tuesday. But some of the interesting things that came out of the workforce uh, survey was that um, licensees, uh, this is, you know, Y'all know this, that licensees really want greater portability between the states. Mm -hmm. um, they are most interested in being um, having licensure in bordering states, and that really it's about providing continuity of care as opposed to being financially based. That actually the people who were in favor of um, the people who were in favor of like greater portability, again, it was about it was about continuity of care and not necessarily wanting to grow their practice in another state. A lot of them reported they already had high high caseloads. They were seeing, you know, over 20 hours a week, um, but they just wanted to be able to do it again, just to provide that continuity of care as people moved on. And um, they also complained that they're, I guess, and I don't know much about this, but I guess apparently if you are in one state and your clients in another, you may not be able to bill insurance for it. And so I guess there was some ongoing frustration with um, with insurance companies around that as well. So um, let's see here, what else came out of that? Um, I did not know this, but WMFT is probably going to be releasing um, their a new or updated uh, ethics code sometime in 2023. So that'll be interesting. Um, let's see here. Um, one thing that they talked about that I was really greatly concerned about is some one way that um, some licensees are getting getting around licensing laws is um, this goes back to the life coaching. So instead of, you know, like we see it where somebody will have their license removed and then they'll just, I'm a now life coach. Um, what other states are seeing is that um, if my client moves to Oklahoma and I want to continue providing services, then I will provide them life coaching. Um, Hold on one second. Um, sorry. Um, so anyway, so basically they will, does that make sense? So like, I'm just going to see my client now in Oklahoma and I'm going to call it life coaching instead of, um, instead of therapy. And so that's how I'm going to get around. Portability. A lot of people do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let me see here. One, two, three, four. Oh no, no, wait, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Mr. Parrish, if you need to leave, we will still have a quorum. I'm so sorry. I forgot. I should have acknowledged that you needed to leave earlier. No, that's no problem. I appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Um, anyway, so I was sad to hear about the way that licensees are abusing that. So, um, okay, let me get back to my other screen. Um, they also covered, they talked about different alternatives to the licensure exam. Um, basically, this has come up um, in part because of complaints about licensure exams maybe being like having a racial bias um, or that they don't really mimic real world experiences. You know, in the real world, if you don't know what to do with a client, you can, you know, call a friend, you can seek consultation, you can open a book, you know what I mean? Um, whereas, you know, on a licensure exam, you don't, you're cut off from all those, those resources. And so anyways, they talked about different alternatives um, to licensure um, examination. Do y'all want me to go over what those, like, are y'all interested? Do you want me to go over what those are? Okay. Um, so essentially the different paths is one is you just consider um, that if somebody has a diploma that they meet, that that proves that they meet the requirements for examination. And so then you would just basically count the diploma as the examination and you would um, just look at, do their post-grad experience. You know, you just have the post-grad experience as the next licensure requirement. Um, path two would be um, applicants would create a portfolio um, and essentially they would submit a portfolio to the board instead of an actual licensure exam um, where they kind of explained what they were doing and why they were doing it. Um, path three um, would be, and actually, and that would happen in that path to that experiential path, like they would do this while they were in their master's program. So essentially while they're in their master's program, they're putting together this portfolio and then they would submit that to the board after graduation. Um, path three is kind of similar, um, except that they would be putting the portfolio together while they are going through their license, you know, through their supervised experience. So they would be basically putting together that portfolio. Um, and also kind of similar to that, um, or actually part of that path three is we would only use board trained supervisors. So we would have to train supervisors to like look for very specific things that then um, those board trained supervisors would would look for and basically sign off on somebody in lieu of doing a licensure exam. Um, and then path four would be some sort of performance task assessment. Um, where it'd be scenario based, it would be an hour and basically they would have, you know, they would be given some sort of scenario and they would have an hour to basically write, you know, what they would do in this situation. Um, and then on top of that, they would also have some multiple choice exams to also uh, measure and then it would be scored by basically two scores. Um, one of the things they talked about is these would be basically alternatives too. So you would have a choice. You could do the licensure exam or you could do this other thing over here. And so... Anyway, so those are just kind of some of the different ideas that they they threw out. So I don't know, thoughts on any of that? Like it, hate it, not really sure. Just take the exam. Yeah. Lisa, can I circle back on something you said a while ago? I just yeah. would like some sure. clarification. Sure. So on this life coach situation, is there any regulation for them at all? No. Okay, so for public safety, is there not any legislative control over that? So I could be a life coach. I could just could. say, yep. I'm yes. going to be a life coach now, yes. and I can get paid paid to do that. And there's 150 no to 300 dollars an hour. Yep. Yeah, maybe I'll look you, into it. You could um, you could be a high you could be a high school dropout, and and be a life coach. There, yeah. There's no educational expectations, requirements, and things like that. I, I will tell you that um, not, even though not we that there's anything wrong with being a high school dropout. I think. Um, even though we didn't discuss it with the rest of the outreach committee report, we did discuss beginning to work on this. So I have on my calendar, which I had already said that I would do it. I'm going to start writing something that we are going to potentially add to our LMFT to our Texas uh, to our BHEC website piece on. What's the difference in a life coach and a fully licensed therapist? The pros and cons with that. And so I will, I'll be starting to write that and then send that out to uh, Chair Merchant and she can distribute it how she wants. And hopefully we'll also be talking about that during our December um, roundtable with the public as well. 
So we are working on that because that's a huge concern. Yeah, well, it is. And I, I, I guess what I just didn't realize how widespread it was. And you can just hang that little shingle out and nobody's controlling you in any way, shape or form. Exactly. And there's no, re there's no repercussions, right? You have no one to go to if you are taken advantage of or oh, yes. uh, abused in that therapeutic relationship. Yeah. There's, there's nothing you can do. And it's, I don't, okay. So I be careful what you click on, on your Facebook feed, because, um, I don't know what I clicked on, but for whatever reason, maybe it's just Google listening to me, but I get like advertisements to how to like become a life coach for $7 make, you know, hundred thousand dollars a year. Like I get these little ads popping up on my, my Facebook all the time. Um, that's basically, and people will comment, I'm in, I'm in, I want to do this, you know, like, um, and it's disheartening to me to see, you know, them trying to take these. And again, I feel like even that right there is like a, a racket because it's like, they're saying, give me your money. I will train you how to be a life coach. And I'm going to put you forth in the world to do something that you're probably unprepared to actually do. Um, so I don't know. They, anyway, they're given a certification. Yeah. So a life coach can get a certification, but they are not granted any type of a license. Right. And there's no regulation, even with the certificate. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and the certifications are not cheap. Mm -hmm. the, the, to be a certified life coach, they'll, they'll charge you big bucks to, to be a certified life coach. You can be a life coach but to be a certified life coach. And I've found that there have been many um, uh, associates and licensees who have tried to get, a, and I think this is the crux of all this that, that was mentioned, get across the interstate um, video therapy. Um, well, what if I just start seeing them as a life coach? I said, well, I don't think you can do that yeah. because your agreement is with them. Your informed consent is you're doing therapy. You're not doing life coaching. So you can't just switch back and forth on a whim with all of that. Depending on where, yeah. Yeah. I've so if you were an LMFT meetings. practicing and then you decided to be a life coach on the side, I mean, I just don't understand. I don't understand how this works. There's, I just, it really concerns me about the lack of, of continuity there. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I, I think. I think the, the, the primary thing is going to be the public perception. If, if, if a public, if, if somebody in, in, in the state of Texas contacts you, are they contacting you to do therapy because of your license? Or are they contacting you because you're a life coach? So maybe a big part of it has to do with what are you presenting to the public? Now, I because will tell you, um, to piggyback off of what uh, Russ just said, when I was in school a million years ago, getting this degree and then getting licensed, I, I was curious about it. So I went to the Austin chapter for life coaches um, to attend some of their meetings and to kind of find out, you know, what, what is the basis and what is the ramifications? I do think that life coaching started because there was such a public misperception that you needed to be crazy to go to therapy. We've been doing a lot better job media wise in letting people know that mental health does not mean crazy. Mental health is no different than physical health. And so the stigma going to therapy is getting less and less, but that was their entry into it because they do every single thing that a therapist does. They work on coaching for jobs. They work on coaching for relationships. They coaching for your business. So they do every single thing without any training. And so kind of to answer one of your questions, Evelyn, is I've seen people, I've seen licensees go into life coaching for three different reasons. Um, I had a, one friend who basically when life coaching first happened, he just saw it as like a business opportunity. You know what I mean? And so he went into life coaching, like he just added life coaching to what he did, but he maintained his license. You know what I mean? But just for people who wanted, it was just like a, just adding something he does. Um, I knew somebody else who went into life coaching because they were actually just tired of being a licensed practitioner. And they, and again, well, they didn't actually do this. We talked them out of doing this. We talked them off the ledge, but they were at the place where they're just like, I'm tired of doing like therapy with these intense cases. I just want a nice, easy, light caseload because I'm kind of burnt out. And so their plan was, I'm going to give up my license and just go into life coaching. Um, anyways, we talked them off the ledge on that. Like I said, um, the third person 
The third case times that I've seen this, this is the part that concerns me the absolute most, is we've seen licensees who have lost their license for things like mm -hmm. sexual and you know sexual relationship with clients, and so they just give up their license and they go into life coaching and they charge three hundred dollars an hour and they keep doing, you know, presumably what they were doing before, but now they're calling it life coaching and that disturbs me. So that's that's in terms of licensees. That's why a licensee would maybe go into life coaching. But. So do we have any, I guess we don't have any jurisdiction over that. We don't have any, we don't have any effect on that. No. And I, I would assume because of the anti-competitive emphasis, we can't even issue a cease and desist. No. We can't do anything about it. Well, historically, um, what I used to do when I was a GC is I would tell people when they would ask me, hey, I want to do life coaching or executive coaching, whatever, whatever it was. It was some nomenclature other than psychology. I would just tell them, look, you can call it whatever you want to, but if you get in trouble, if somebody complains about you, I'm going to look at substantively what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if, if substantively is what you're doing is the practice of psychology, then yeah, you're going to be in trouble. So you've got to go look at the practice definition for psychology and you got to figure it out if, if, and most of the time, I'm sure they didn't do that. And they just went on with what they were going to do anyway. Uh, they were hoping I would just email back and say, yeah, that's fine. So I, I never wanted to just say, Hey, I ain't got no jurisdiction over you. So you go do whatever you want to do. I kind of ran a little bit of a bluff on them. Um, but you're going to run into some first amendment issues there. Uh, you know, in this kind of stuff, just that seraphin case that we had, uh, at psychology where we got our, our, the definition for the practice of psychology shot down. We, if you start really going after these guys actively, it won't be long till one of them bows up on you and then you're in a First Amendment case. And agencies haven't been faring too well in those lately. So it, you got to be real careful. What You got to be careful the battle you pick there. Okay. Any other questions about AMFTRB or anything? Thank you for representing us there and bringing back Very such great so. information. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Um, I can't think of anything else that I need to address. Is there anything I'm forgetting? I don't think so. Um, yeah, so let's move on to agenda item. Hang on, where are we at? Um, 19. Yeah, 19. Let's move on to 19. So... This would be um, a report from the board delegates. Um, so Janine, that would be you. I don't have as much to report as I normally do. So I'm gonna ask executive director Spinks to speak up here. The reason is I missed the last one and wasn't able to attend. We have our upcoming meeting on Tuesday, the 25th. And then we have our next standardization committee meeting where we're continuing to look at supervision um, and how that's gonna actually work. And we're gonna be doing that in December. And the substance stuff, take it away. Ha, 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 ha. Well, as I feel the bus roll over me here, I'll see if I can get up and finish. So true, so true, I, I so did, sorry. Uh, I, I, really don't have, I really don't have anything. I think Sarah gives y'all a pretty detailed report uh, of what's, you know, what's been going on at the council, really just a lot of rulemaking, uh, that's been going on. And a lot of it's been related to the CE rules. So, I mean, other than that, and you guys were one of the first ones out of the gate there. In fact, you're all, y'all are already coming back to do the cleanup on adding the hospitals and doing the, the, the effective date of that. Everybody else is kind of coming in behind you on that. So really don't have anything to add to it. Um, uh, everything's been running smoothly. Yay. Um, so uh, there just hasn't been yeah. any hiccups. Uh, we haven't had any real problems. You know, Everybody's we've submitted playing nicely together. Yeah, we've submitted our LAR. Uh, I've gone over and had the first round of hearings. Been there's been some back and forth on with the LBB on our LAR, but that's typical. Uh, the big thing that probably licensees are most interested in is the the fee rule. Of course, that's been proposed and that will be adopted. I'm assuming it'll be adopted at Tuesday's meeting. So. Uh, that's going to be the, that's the biggest thing I think that's going on right now uh, at, at the council. So 
That's yeah, it. we realized in our initial talking with supervision that we're going to have to have a legislative fix on a couple of our supervision suggestions. And one of them, I think we talked about it last meeting, was instead of this, uh, it's kind of a two different messages. In one part, it says that our supervisees have to get 200 hours. But in another part, it says they have to have supervision for the whole time they are seeking licensure. So really, they could end up with 240 hours or 210 or something like that. So it's kind of a bait and switch on them. So we'd like to get that cleaned up to where it basically says, as long as you are seeking your licensure, you have to be in supervision once a week. That, I got that message really clear from you guys that you were not interested in doing an LPC version of supervision where they have to have four hours a month, doesn't matter where the four hours hit, that you guys were really more, you know, we want them to be in supervision once a week, unless, you know, they're on vacation or just cause, once a week, the entire time they're in supervision, because that does end up at least getting 200 and usually more. Does that make sense? But to do that, we have to have a legislative fix because it's a statute piece. So will our fees be going down? Yeah, you, know, you would think the executive director would know that off the top of his head, but I do not. Okay. I would have to defer the chair to the actual rule. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I guess was it in my was it in the packet? Because no, I know it's, it it's it's not in your packet. Okay. It's not, it's not in there. No worries. Um, okay. Any other discussion about agenda item 19? Yep. Yes, Dr. Elder. Um, I just want to go back to um what Miss Smith was talking about. So the fix you're saying is that we would get rid of the 200 hour requirement for supervision by changing statute that would require legislative action. And therefore we would say, you just have to be under supervision once a week for the time that you're accruing hours. But that would not give them 200 hours because if you're two, two years is our minimum and that's once a week. So 52 weeks a year, that's 104 hours of supervision rather than 200. So that's a pretty substantive change to our supervision requirements. And I'm wondering. It's not much of a change actually. And the reason is not. because they're allowed to bring in a hundred hours. Cause that was the and they're pre-graduate hours. Yeah. yeah. So we found that they couldn't get the 200. I'm assuming, I don't know how the 100 rule came into being but I'm assuming it's because the 200 was probably too high. And so they were allowed to bring in a hundred from their, their graduate program. So it doesn't change the postgraduate experience at all because, okay, okay, no, just curious. It doesn't, but I'm glad you brought that up because when you very first look at it, it's like, whoa, wait a minute, but you have to, you know, go a little bit further into mm -hmm. it. So, okay, all right. One, one thing that we could, that could happen and uh, we'd have to talk about how, okay, so whenever, whenever the licensing standards committee used to like see all of the contentious licensing cases, one of the things that would come up is I can remember we had one person who, I don't know, was getting supervision like once or twice a month, um, went like six weeks without getting, you know, supervision at all. Um, and we ended up not counting those hours. So basically staff ended up going back and looking at, they looked at all the weeks that she missed supervision um, and they did not count any of those hours. Um, so we would have to think about that, that if we have somebody who says that well, let me just ask you this. If the rule did change to that, whenever a licensee submitted their hours reports or would they wouldn't submit, whenever they, whenever they became done with their hours, would they even tell you how many hours they got? Or would their supervisor just say they got- Well, the supervisor would still have to be tracking that they are in supervision once a week. But what would they turn they into the board? still have to track that. What? But what would they turn into the board? The total uh, numbers. The total numbers, just like they do now. Okay. Right. Now, the total words, number of supervision like, hours? Right. No, I think words, that it, count would go away and it would just be. No, the, no, no, because okay. we no. do want to verify that they are meeting one hour a week. So if they meet for uh, two years, that's 24 or whatever it is. Or if they meet for three and, years. Uh, th okay, three years is. is, is 150. Yeah, and, and that's what you would put. We met for uh, 36 months and or how many ever weeks that is and then times one that that's how many hours 
of supervision okay, so, they accrued. So I, I like that better because that's basically saying you're you're truly staying on top of it all the way through the process. One week, one hour, one week, one hour, one week, one hour for as long as they're licensed. And as soon as they finish licensure, you have all those hours uh, accumulated and that's the number. So they're not, one of the things I'm running into is they're finishing their, their direct and their indirect hours but but they're they're having to tweak a little bit of their supervision hours and and that can be a challenge so if they okay so let's suppose on the form it says how many hours of supervision did you get and they put 100 but we know based on when they were licensed they have been licensed for three years which means they're short 50 what would staff do with that I would assume they would kick it back just like staff does right now if they look and they're lacking supervision hours but then they would not be able to count the hours, the clinical hours they accrued the weeks that they didn't receive supervision. Is that what you're saying, Dr. Merchant? Yeah, I'm just wondering how staff would handle that. So I don't know if that's something that Mr. Spear can answer or not. I don't know. Well, I think we're kind of premature on even talking about this stuff because okay, we're trying to legislate a fix. And mm -hmm. since it hasn't been fixed yet, I don't know that we should really be chewing on this grizzle. So true. That's true. Getting ahead of ourselves. Okay. Oh, the voice of reason. Darn it. Grief. Okay, so I did have another question about the BHEC report. Is that I see that on the bottom it says upgrading and redesigning the council's website. I'm curious about the plan for that. I really think the website's great. Well, um, I've always told people the color scheme's ugly. I freely admit to that. Um, but I, I, me and uh, the the webmaster, the, the web guy for HPC designed the current website. So you didn't you didn't get like a real pro that in terms of me doing it. But when we did our, our customer service survey or our strategic plan survey, everybody was like, "Oh, the website's terrible. You know, it needs to be more user friendly." Blah 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 blah. I think a lot of what that is coming from is it, it's just new for people. This is kind of their first time, the first renewal cycle. Use It's just something new because when I started showing it around, I started shopping around to find out what's it going to cost to get this thing professionally revamped. Everybody was like, there's not really anything wrong with it. It's actually a pretty good design. We changed the ugly colors and maybe make a few, uh, a few minor tweaks to it. But for the most part, the, the guts of it are good. Um, I, just by way of, if y'all want to know how crazy it is on stuff like this, the, the cost for revamping our website, Jenny and I got a quote to do it. It ranged from $60,000 to $1.5 million for our website. And I'd, so be, what, I'd be glad to do it for $25,000. <laughs> okay, okay. So magnanimous, Russ. You are such Square a... Square space. Hero. Where's okay. Space? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dr Dreamweaver. I can I can uh, do that. But but the thing is, you know, uh, Mr. Spinks, you're you're talking about the color scheme. I, I'm okay with the color scheme because to me that's that's kind of a government mindset color scheme, mm -hmm. and I, I I that's kind of what I I'm not going to say it's what I expected, but I am not surprised nor am I offended by the color scheme. And because I, I like the colors because that that tracks. And if you change the colors, if you have the same website and you change the colors, I guarantee you people are going to get weirded out. Yeah. Because it's it looks that it different. Looks and different. They're, even though every every link is going to be the same. So yeah. I'm just that's my two cents. Well, I agree completely. The guts. Not, yeah, this was not proposed by the by BHEC Good. Council. Good. So this was not driven. This this idea about doing this, it wasn't driven by Director Sphinx, wasn't driven by, it was driven from a few outside voices. And my thought is, if they only knew what it used to be mm. in all of these licenses, what we used to have to deal with, they would be singing hallelujah and dancing down the street. Mm -hmm. But so that that's that's why I didn't really report on it because there really isn't anything to report. Um, so there you go. And and if there was is one suggestion I would make to the website is to make sure that LMFT A or LMFT associate is gone, that that's changed because I I think there's places where that's a carryover from the 
from the like the LPC dash intern or whatever it is, but there's no dash. But there are places on the website that it does still say LMFT dash associate or LMFT dash A, or even for the LPC, it's got the thing that that would be just one thing. Not a big deal, but it's a deal. Thank, thanks for complaining. Okay, any other discussion on it's agenda a, item it's 19? A gift. Okay, then let's move on to agenda item number 20, report from the board administrator. And so uh, Mr. Spear is going to be giving that report. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I am sitting in for Sarah Fassholtz, and I would like to take this opportunity to note that my lack of participation in this meeting is a direct reflection of the hard work that she did before this meeting, mm -hmm. because she is always super prepared. And so I want to say a quick thank you to Sarah Fassholtz. I am a very fortunate person in that my staff are awesome. Sarah Fassholtz, Christina DeLuna, and Diane Moore are all terrific and do a tremendous job, and I'm very fortunate for that. Um, just wanted to point out that our licensing database is undergoing an upgrade as we speak, so it is offline and will come back online. Um, it's scheduled to come back online this Monday, so please bear with us while we're going through that. Um, that is a big part of why we've had to hold off on a lot of the uh, want to do's and need to do's as far as the licensing system is concerned. Um, the jurisprudence exams will still be available. Our website is still available. This is strictly the online database only. Um, other than that, that's pretty much the gist of my uh, report because things are moving really well. Um, as noted earlier, the, uh, we've only got like five cases left that are from the teens. Um, everybody's getting licensed at a pretty good clip. We had, uh, over the past year, uh, we had a, uh, we increased the number of, of licensees in this state by almost 4,000. It's a lot. Close to a 5% uh, growth rate, which is enormous. Mm -hmm. And that will conclude my report unless you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Spear. Okay, let's move on to agenda item number 21, which is discussion on possible action regarding future priorities and actions, activities of the board. Is there anything that we need as a board to be looking at that we are not already? Okay, hearing no discussion, um, we will move on to um, public comment. Okay. Um, in the uh, we're about to start the public comment portion of the meeting. Public comment will be accepted in person or virtually. In-person commenters will be heard first, followed by those on computer, and then those who are att attending telephonically. If you wish to provide comment and are using the video conferencing software, please use the raised hand function uh, at the bottom of the screen to alert staff. Each commenter will be given three minutes to address the board. Commenters will be alerted when 30 seconds are left in their allotted time. And lastly, public comment is not a forum for discussion with the board. The Texas Open Meeting Act uh, prohibits the board from discussing topics that are not posted on the uh, official agenda. So it will be your opportunity to tell the board what you think, but it won't be a back and forth. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spear. Um, there are no um, people in person, so. So do we have anybody online or yeah, you, you want me to to bring them in I line? Think I have the I don't think I have that authority built in. OK, I'll do it. Uh, Miss Martin, did you have public comments you wanted to give? Yes, sir, I do. Very, very calm and quiet ones. Just want to thank you for your service today. Appreciate the hard work that you do. I know I'm sitting here thinking about the hours and hours and hours that goes into being on this board and then the documents that you have to look at for just for meetings, let alone anything else. And um, so we don't give you enough appreciation. I think if we have a complaint, we'll bring it. Don't have one this morning. So thank you for your service. I am the governmental liaison for Christian Counselors of Texas. So we try to keep our attitude toward you, Christian. Uh, appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Hey, 
Okay, that's all the folks with the raised hand. I'll move on to the one telephone caller that we have. Oop, they hung up on me. No more public comment, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, then we will move on to agenda item number 23, announcements and comments not requiring board action. Um, so we do have a couple of upcoming events. Um, we have TCA is coming up in November, and Dr. Elder and Dr. Barti, I believe, are both going to be presenting at that. Um, as I mentioned, next week, WMFT is going to be going over the workforce um, um, study of their, they did a workforce survey, and they're going to be going over that. And I'm interested to see, to learn more about just the workforce of, you know, what's happening with MFTs across the country. So I'll be in attendance to that. Um, um, I believe uh, Mr. Spinks can probably speak more to this, but I believe on December 12th, there's going to be kind of like a legislative update to kind of talk about the legislative agenda. Um, and that is also a webinar. Is there anything you want to say about that, Mr. Spinks? Uh, that is a, let's see, it's not December 12th. Or December 11th, maybe? No. Oh, it's it's December 8th. Right. Yeah, the Texas Tribune is putting on a preview of the 88th legislative session. Uh, it's anybody can sign up for it. You just go to the Texas Tribune's oh. website and sign up there. Uh, or if you're in the Lubbock area, I think that's where it's going to be live if you wanted to join it live. But uh, anyway, take a look at that. It'll just kind of give you a snapshot. Oftentimes it's handy for identifying what the big issues are going to be on the, in the legislative session. It's not going to tell you what the sleeper issues are or, or the plethora of smaller issues, but You'll, you'll be able to glean what the big ones are going to be facing the 88th legislature. Okay. Um, also, um, so I think that's it. Our next board meeting is going to be in, um, in um, some month, January. Uh, our next board meeting is going to be in January. Then we'll also have TAMFT will be the beginning of uh, March. And then, of course, also I forgot to mention we have the uh, – the lunch and learn slated for, I believe it was December 2nd, that um, that Friday. Um, the only other possible, I guess, maybe announcement um, is that uh, we have two board members who are up for um, renewal, uh, Mr. Francis and Mr. Uh, or Chaplain Stoglin. Um, their terms expire in February. And um, I have not heard about whether Mr. Francis plans to um, seek um, re renewal. Uh, Chaplain Stoglin um, is being called in a different direction, though. There's some opportunities that he has um, in term in ministry, um, and so he is going to be. Um, um, he's. I wish he was here so we could tell you about it. But, um, anyways, but he is uh, going to be rotating off the board. That is sometimes a long process. So even though his term is up in February, he will continue to serve until um, he has a replacement. So, who knows? That could be immediate or it could be a year from now. Like we just don't know, but um, just know that that change is coming. Um, I think that's it. So I can't think of any other announcements. Dr. Elder? Well, I know we skipped the agenda item earlier on about appointing our BHEC representative. Is that something we cannot conduct because Mr. Francis is not here? Well, I will say that I kind of honestly failed in my chair duties and I forgot to reach out to Mr. Francis to see if he's oh. interested in being um, reappointed. And so also, I just think that I need to have probably a conversation with him to find out one, if he's going to stay on the board and if he is okay. going to stay on the board, whether or not he wants to be reappointed to BHEC. Um, and then if he does not, then I need to find, I need to tap somebody, one of y'all on the shoulder and see who would be willing to do that. But we have time because we're meeting again in January and he doesn't roll off until February. Is that right? As far as timeline goes? Right. But even if he is expired in February, if they don't have somebody to replace him, he will continue to serve until they do have somebody to replace him. Okay. Thank you. Because it is a public member that we're replacing. not the he will, member. Yeah. He will continue to serve on this board. His, his term on BHEC will end in, um, well, no, I can't remember if his term on BHEC is. I think it's February. I'll have to look and see now. I'm confusing myself, but the the next the next BHEC meeting is the 31st. So, but his MFT board term wouldn't it, he'd be he'd be fine for the next BHEC meeting. He would still be there for that, I think. So. Yeah, it says that his del his delicacy is that a word? I don't know. Anyways, it expire his term expires February 1st, 2023, which is also the same day that his um, MFT his, board his MFT board they both expire on the same yeah. day. Okay. So 
Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, any other items, things for item number 21? Okay, then that means that we are on to adjournment. So um, would somebody like to make a motion to adjourn? Okay, Dr. Make a motion Barty. to adjourn. Dr. Barty um, seconds, all those in favor? Okay, thank you all for your service. I appreciate each and every one of you for taking the time to be here. We are all very busy. And so I appreciate your service in all of this. Um, kudos to y'all for doing great work and we will see y'all next, next time. So this me meeting is dismissed at 1141. Good to see everyone. Janine, go do your homework for next week's meeting. Oh, that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.